been going on a little bit too long. So if things seem to be getting tiring or we're going on too long, please say so, okay? Yeah, but it's not really too long because it's supposed to be three hours. Yeah, but what we talked about, we're getting rid of the supposed to be very early on. We decided we're not really doing the supposed to be because the supposed to be is for normal times and we're living through like not normal times, right? Does that make sense? You know? Um, I just gave, I, I was, I'll tell you one more short story, one more short digression. I'm, I'm now part of the University Senate, which is for the first time I've ever been. So they asked me to give it to Bar Torah, which I agreed to do because they, all the Bar Yilan functions like have to do Torah at the beginning, which I think I find both kind of adorable and extremely annoying. But anyway, they asked me to do it. Um, so I said I would do it if I did it in English. And I talked about how um, that Aaron understood when his sons died, Lo Elena, when his sons died, that it was a trauma. Rabbi Soloveitchik says the two kinds of traumas. One is cosmic, one is catastrophic. Two kinds of revelation. One is cosmic, one is catastrophic. So cosmic revelation, no, no hands, no questions. Cosmic revelation is Isaiah. And, um, and uh, catastrophic revelation is uh, Yecheskel, is Ezekiel, right? So it's interesting that he calls even that, I mean, that becomes a paradigm for him, that God makes himself present in a time of catastrophe, right? So I was saying to my colleagues that for that we're as teachers, you know, and Aaron goes on and is a great teacher, brings people together. Um, he, serves, he serves people, um, serves the people of Israel. So I said, as teachers, we also have this kind of leadership role. And part of that leadership role is to acknowledge that this is a traumatic time. Right? Because if you don't acknowledge that it's a dramatic time, you can't possibly teach. Um, I didn't see the responses of them, but I assume that's not what they expected to hear. Right? Because it's usually some Jewish studies guy who does like some very complicated, you know, hermeneutics, whatever. Anyway, so see, no, we are not. That's so the three hours we are supposed to have, and I'm happy to stay for those who want to stay for that long. But let, anyway, the goal is for me to stop telling you stories and to start teaching Milton. Um, how was it reading um, Paradise Lost Book 3? I mean, I found it, I, I, I mean, I, I've, been, I've, been, I've been teaching Milton for a long time. I found it going back to it very difficult. I thought like books one and two are much easier compared to this. Yeah. Much easier. Right. Yeah, why, why, is it, why is book three more difficult? Well, I don't, I don't, I don't know if it's more difficult in a um, stylistic sense. It's just right. uh, until the ending, it's not as uh, seductive of a narrative to resolve. Right. I mean, it's like people have always said that that Paradise Lost God is the God is really boring in Paradise Lost. Um, can you see my screen still? Right. Yes. This this is a book. We haven't looked at much criticism, but Milton and criticism can be extremely entertaining because people get very upset and they're very committed about Milton. So this is William Emson, who wrote a book called Milton's God. Let me just say I'm looking for the yellow part. I think maybe it's the end. He wrote a book called Milton's God. And he, he actually, he's one of the things that he says that other critics pretty much agree on is that, um, that Satan gets the best, I mean, God gets the worst part. Right, he's the most boring, isn't he? I mean, and you go from books one and two to book three, which is really just full of all this doctrinal stuff, which is kind of weird, right? Meaning Milton is, Milton is obviously at the very beginning of book three, trying to deal with the problem of reward and punishment, divine foreknowledge and free will. And he presents that um, in a way that's just so totally different than, than what we've seen in books one and two. Going back on book one and two, I almost thought that the whole thing is just a series of different metaphors about Satan, right? And then you get to this almost antiseptic book three, right? Which starts off with this doctrine. So that's, that was just for me very, very off-putting. Um, anybody else have any comments about book three? I think that it's, it's very reflective of how people often, people from the outside view religion that, you know, and possibly people from the inside who aren't taught religion very well. Mm. It's that the, the doing the bad things mm. is very seductive and, and the religion stuff seems very dry and very irrelevant and very boring because who cares about one person's ox who bored another person's ox in the market? 
Like mm. no one cares. Mm. Right. So I guess um, maybe there's a more of a, maybe Satan has a better, Satan, poetry is more appropriate to Satan than to God. Is that true? I think in the understanding of the, the I guess, to use your metaphor of the poor reader of religion. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Um, let's go back a little bit, though. Um, it is, it, it's, Satan does get the better metaphors, though, doesn't he? Yeah, because... And, 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 and God is this plain style. Here's what, here's what, um, I mean, Ems, let me just read you. What, that makes sense. I, I, I found the quotation from Emson. He says, it is, it is a tremendous moral cleansing for Milton's God. Um, he's talking about in that, as we'll see in this Milton's God says, eventually we won't need this hierarchy and I'll be all in all. We'll get it to that. It's it, interesting metaphysics in book three. It is a tremendous moral cleansing for Milton's God after the greed for power, which can be felt in him everywhere else, to say that he will give his throne to incarnate man, and the rhythm around the word humiliation, I guess Milton uses that term, is like, take, is like taking off in an airplane. He's writing in the 30s or 40s. I had long felt that this is much the best moment of God in the poem, morally as well as poetically, without having any idea why it came there. Um, it, it comes there because he's envisaging God's abdication and the democratic appeal of the prophecy of God is what makes the whole picture of him just tolerable. I mean, that was a complicated passage and Emson writes in a way that he's, he's taking seriously his readers. Um, but he says the only thing that makes Milton's God tolerable is that there's something democratic about his prophecy. At another point in, 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 in Milton's God, and maybe I should have just quoted this right away, um, Emson compares Milton's God to Uncle Joe Stalin, right? And Stalin is like, and, and Emson is writing at a time when Stalin is in power. So, so that's, just, it's like, a, I mean, Emson was a very committed atheist and he used Milton to not only, to really attack his Christian critical um, uh, contemporaries. Have you ever read C.S. Lewis? Yeah. Are you ever, he also wrote those fairy tales, right? The, the Lion, the Wind, and the Wardrobe. So Lewis was Michael like, Sternier. so he was like one of the great critics of the, of the 30s and 40s, but very Christian in his orientation. And he Christian. really, and he really turned Paradise Lost into this very, very highly Christian, non-heretical, um, non-problematic epic. Mm -hmm. So Emson, when attacking Milton Scott, what he's really doing is attacking C.S. Lewis, because they're like these two critics who are coming from these opposite perspectives. Um, but it is an interesting, I mean, I, I thought, oh my God, I read Emson first this morning, and I thought, oh my God, this is gonna be really boring. But it turns out that not all of book three, I mean, not all of book three really is like that. And the end, um, when Satan makes his flight from, from or through chaos to heaven, we really, we return, to, we return to those metaphors. And here's the question that I wanted to ask you, and I don't think much, most critics don't even ask this. Is there, is, should we look for a relationship between the different parts of individual books? I mean, is there a relationship between what we get at the beginning of book three with all that Christian doctrine and the end of book three? I guess it ends with that meeting of, of um, Satan on his way to heaven. He meets the archangel Uriel, and interestingly, Uriel cannot, he's a bad reader. Uriel's a bad reader he can't, because he can't read Satan's hypocrisy. Why, why does Milton make um, uh, Uriel, an angel, a bad reader? May I? Um, I'd like everybody else to have a chance to have their wheels turn a little bit. Um, well, it's not so much about um, why Oriel is a bad reader, but I was thinking why on the whole is Satan so much more compelling mm. than, than everyone in heaven? And because Satan is allowed to have character development. Um, and I was thinking why, why is he allowed to have that? And I think there's something here with that because he's on the side of evil or that the fact that he's bad, you can play around with him. And because God is good because mm. heaven is good they're kind of static in their perfection right um, i mean uh, so, they can't they can't so, see beyond what what they are right so milton 
we would look we would look as opposed to Emson. We would look to Milton to have to have a poetics of the divine that makes sense to us, right? Meaning, what, what what's been bothering me? A poetics. What what was bothering Can you? Me, repeat that, please. The bit about a, the a poetics of representing the divine that makes sense. Okay, meaning if we've been showing the way in which Milton through his metaphors of Satan is so skeptical about representation and is so much aware that what he's doing, that he's, I mean, that, that he's taking responsibility for representation, which is by definition something risky because it may turn in me to thinking that something is other, make me take the divine for one of the images that I'm seeing or to take Satan for one of the images that I'm seeing. Remember we mentioned that in, in shifting metaphoric perspectives, it's almost like Milton is internalizing the process of Midrash in his poem. Midrash is you never see things from one perspective. There's always more than one story. It's never just one. And the multiplicity of them qualify them in such a way that tells you in a way, and I've been thinking about this also, that Midrash in a way is the most iconoclastic genre because it's never, it, because by sharing so, I mean, if you have a, a, a Midrash rabbi, I actually bought this in English, which has just been fantastic for me. It's just page after page after page. This is on two partio, right? Um, and so I, I think, so if that's true of Milton as well, that he uses these different lenses, these different metaphoric perspectives to, to make us understand that, well, I'm letting you see, but if you think what you see is what there is, well, you know, you're, you're reading improperly. Meaning if you mistake my representation for the thing itself, then you're being a bad reader. So that works really well with Satan. But then you have a representation, as the Havid said, of God, as it were, in, in this prose of clarity. And that seems just so kind of weird to me. Shouldn't God be the most obscured by language and metaphor? Shouldn't Milton say to us a thousand times over, don't what you're seeing is not really God? You hear my, before you answer, did you hear my question? Should I rephrase the question? Before, before you go, why is multiplying it, lenses and perspective is iconoclastic? What, what, what? You said that the, by multiplying the perspective and lenses yeah. is being iconoclastic. Um, why is that? I, I think what's built into that, if you have different representations of the same thing, and they all have a certain kind of authority, meaning whatever, I experience all of them in the poem. So it's going to take away the temptation for me of identifying any one of those images as the thing itself. That is idolatry, thinking that the image is the thing itself. So I see that works really great with Satan. And I'm not gonna walk away and say, oh, now I know what Satan is because Milton has so multiplied the perspectives by which I see Satan that I see that Satan, and Milton says this a billion times, he'll give us all the metaphoric buildup and then he'll say, oh, well, you know, Satan is beyond compare. Well, you just spent 300 lines comparing, them, right? He does that again and again. So, I mean, in, in a way, that this is like the answer to the undergraduate question about, you know, how does Milton and his, how does he, just how does he put together both his iconoclasm and his image making by just this, right? Remember that question from 206? How does Milton, how is Milton both an iconoclast and a Renaissance man, a creator of images? And I think a simple answer is, well, by through the multiplication of images, he's really under, undermining the images. Through telling you that what you thought you saw you didn't see, he's using the image in a way to undermine the image. So my question again is, Alana, and I, you know, please feel free to interrupt me. Uh, my question again is, if you have such a skepticism and you show it through this method of the multiplication of images in relationship to Satan, well, shouldn't that be all the more so in relationship to God? Meaning don't hold up God and say, here he is. Remember the apostle Paul says, um, now we look through a face darkly, uh, through a glass darkly, then face to face. Um, Milton quotes that in Ari Pagitica. We're, we're not at the, we, we're not, Milton says we're not at the face to face with Satan. How can he give me the impression, this is the question, that I'm with, the, that I have the face to face in relationship to God? 
That makes sense, the question now? Mm -hmm. The face-to-face -face bit confused me. Well, face-to-face -face just saying, I'm seeing without mediation. Seeing, seeing oh, so that uh, why is God simple if Satan is complex? Kind of, kind of. Yeah. So God is not, but, so God is not as, as, as obscure as Satan? It, right, I mean, God is not obscured in the same way, not even obscured. A mil the poet doesn't ad the, mil the poet doesn't admit his insufficiency in relationship to God as much. And I'm not talking about saying explicitly, oh, I can't do this, because he does do that. But with Satan, he's always, by using so many metaphors, as I said before, just showing that one metaphor <laughs> and language by itself will never, in and of itself, show you the thing itself. Okay, so, yeah. Somebody wants to, I, I asked that question not for an answer, but let's hear if we, people want to give us a head start on it. Yeah, who said something? Shuki? No, Ben? I'm brooding. You're brooding. No. We've, ups we, we've upset you? You're brooding in a bad way or oh, brooding is good for you? Good. You, like brood you like brooding. Okay, yeah, that's an L, yeah. Um, I, I'm reminded of a quote I mean, this is a pop culture quote, but still, it, it seems to apply that the truth is singular, lies are words and words and words. I think, right. I think this, you could flip the question the other way around, because if Milton was to suddenly portray God with all of this kind of, with the same kind of shifting lens as Satan, you'd ask, well, but God is simpler. Why does God not use extended metaphor? The answer may just be because God is, because truth is that simple. I think that's what, I, have to use extended I, 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 I th I, So yeah, I think that's what Zahavid said, but it still bugs me. Yeah. I mean, that's what, that's what people have been saying. Well, Milton uses this plain style when he talks to God, when, when, when the divine speaks, because really what you both said, um, it still annoys me. It annoys me because I, I, I want, I, I, I'm so used to Miltonic skepticism about the nature of the image. So it just bugs me that he's so willing to, to do it. But I hear, I hear what you're saying makes a lot of sense to me. Um, uh, yes, Tim. Well, um, I remember I asked you about Satan at the end of last class, two classes ago. Um, and, you, and I said that I think Satan in Paradise Lost is not necessarily Satan, the divine force that Milton believes in. And I think that possibly the God that is being represented in Paradise Lost is not the same God. Have I frozen? No, no, you're good. Um, I mean, I, th I think, I think. Is not well, the same God that, that he believes in. He's not presenting the God as, God as, um, how do you say masculine in English? Oh, so let, let's not go there. I like very much. Let, let's, presenting let's work, God let's, as the simple man sees him, as the let, leader sees him. Okay, let's work with what you said. That I like what you said that the, I mean, the Satan that's represented is not the Satan that Milton believes in. I think the Satan that Milton believes in would be very hard to identify or to give language to. Um, and you want to say the same thing about a God? Maybe, maybe. Uh, um, so let's, let's read. So what we're going to do now, I think, or I hope, is okay. Should we take? Should we just take a deep breath? I'm going to take a deep breath, okay? Like I just had this need to check my email now. I don't know. I was like, or I just have a need to just chill for a second. Right. Okay. Um, so. I had a meeting yesterday for four hours. Oh, oh my God. That's right. awful. Oh, that was the meeting that I give the Debbie Tower for, right? Um, wow. So I took a picture of my Zoom image where I looked like I'm paying attention and then I used it as my Zoom image. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Amazing. No, I'm just saying, for, no, it's easier to sit in a Zoom, a Zoom class. Is this practical if you, advice, or? No, no. I mean, for, I just, no, I'm just saying, if you want to get up, you can get up in the middle and, no, you know, I understand. But if I get up in the middle, it's like I'm, you're looking in an empty chair, right? So I mean, that's why I took the break for myself. Um, so this is a confusing beginning. I mean, the first, once we see the first thing that he's doing in the first line, hell, holy light. Just, he's writing this epic and... And how does this, 
how does either of the first three lines kind of just key us into what he's been doing all along? Excuse me, or what he's been doing so far. One of the weird things about Paradise Lost is that there are four invocations, book one, book three, book seven, and book nine. And I thought book four was one also. It kind of looks like one, but I guess it isn't. What's an invocation technically? Calling the muses. Like right, calling out to the muse, right? So the summoning of the muse. Um, how does it work in Homer and Virgil? Sing to me, oh muse. Right, sing heavenly muse, right. So Milton, so now going back to that, this, these first three words with that framework in mind. Well, the, in the first one, he called upon the Holy Spirit and here he calls upon holy light. Right, I mean, maybe, maybe it's already obvious what he's doing. Milton's, Milton's muse is not the ordinary muse, right? So the hail holy light, on the one hand, we're getting that sing that we get from Homer and Virgil, but his muse is different from the muse of the classics. I mean, just to remember how much this is an epic poem and how much it's, how strange it really is in an epic poem to invoke um, some part of the Trinity as the muse. He sublimates the muse. Why is that strange? Because it's, it's, because it's, it's a, a completely Greek, it's a Greek genre in which he's introducing Christian terms, right? Oh, okay. That, that part, right? Domesticating Greek culture. Right, or, I know, domesticating maybe, right? Or subordinating it. Domesticating may be better. Um, Could it be and I, know, I, know, I, I, I don't like, to, I, so we have, let's, we have, a, we have a, a quiz now, or a, a secor. We have domesticating, what was, what was domesticating? What was the other one? Sublimating. 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 We'll go for the Freudian one. What was another one? Subordinating. Oh, that was mine. Or sanctifying. 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 Hmm. What did we say? One more time. A, domesticating. B, subordinating. C, sanctifying. D, what was the other one? D? Sublimating. Yeah, it's the reason I forgot that one. Yeah. <laughs> why, why, why is sublimating inappropriate here? Despite all of my Freudian tendencies, I just don't like it in this case. But you'll, you'll give us a reason to explain, D, um, in a minute. Or why don't you take it now, C? Why do you, why do you like sublimating? I don't know. It's just that's what came to my mind. Okay. Um, Right, I don't know, what, what, sub, what does sublimating mean? Sublimating means to take one set of energies and transform them into another. Oh, I get that. So that's, I get, the way, take, I get what you're saying. To take forbidden energies and turn them into something that is permissible. Oh, so we really like, so now we, I really like C, so I take it back, right? So he's taking this tremendous energy and for, or this drive for, for, for being a Greek poet and he's Christianizing it. Might be better to say taboo rather than forbidden if we're doing for it. Right. Um, and sanctifying, yeah, yeah, maybe, kind of, right? Yes and no, <laughs> right? Um, I wouldn't say domesticating because I think the poetry is always ex escaping in a way. Uh, by domesticating, Not, I mean yeah. making it safe. Okay, a little bit what C was saying there. Yeah. Okay, um, but good, that's interesting. So let, let's just, I'll, tr I'll try to read uninterrupted till, oh, that's gonna be impossible. Um, to here, I think. Yeah, let's go to line 26 in the middle first. Hail, holy light, offspring of heaven's firstborn, or of the eternal, co-eternal beam, <clears throat> ahem. Anybody have a note for that? They don't even bother, it's so complicated. The eternal, co-eternal beam. I mean, I don't, I don't know what Milton is doing here. May I express the unblamed? So here we said that Milton, what does he mean when he says, may I express the unblamed? Okay. Yeah, yeah. My, my Freudian anxiety has gotten into my words, right? Am I worthy? Meaning the epic narrator is worried about representation, right? Like we just said before, he's worried about representing things that maybe are not, um, as he says later on, maybe not permissible to, to mortal sight. I've seen things I shouldn't have seen and I'm telling things I shouldn't have, I'm writing things I should, might not be able to, shouldn't be right. Um, 
And never, but an unapproached light dwelt from eternity dwelt in thee, bright effluence of bright essence in create. Beautiful line, not really sure what it means. It seems to emphasize both the substantial, I mean the, the spiritual and effluence. What's an effluence? A pouring or streaming forth the bright essence, but in create, oh, in create is not created, wrong I am. Bright effluence of bright essence in create. It's almost as if it has no substance. Or here is the rather pure ethereal stream whose, fa whose fountain, who shall tell? Well, everything that I said before about Milton not dealing with heaven in, in metaphorical terms, well, that's completely wrong because right here are these metaphors which are absolutely almost impossible to understand, right? And we do get that or. Um, before the sun, before the heavens thou wert and at the voice of God as with the mantle didst invest the rising waters, deep, dark and deep, one from the void and formless infinite. So I guess here, who is he addressing? Which, one, which part of the Trinity? The Holy Spirit? Right, because we saw that in book one also, that, that the, the Holy Spirit was, or the spirit, the Ruach Elohim of book one of Genesis is turned into by Milton, by association, the Holy Spirit in the, in the, in the invocation to book one. Here he's explicit about it. The, now he's revisiting, what does it mean to have a sacred muse? The I revisit now with bolder wing escape the Stygian pool, though long detained in that obscure sojourn. Where, where has the poet been detained? A pool in hell? I, I, meaning now I'm finally revisiting you after escaping that Stygian pool, after escaping hell, though long detained in that obscure sojourn. Me, mm -hmm. And here again, we see this, I think a Miltonic principle um, in order to go up, you have to go down. And Milton really starts with that. I spent two books in hell, and now I can revisit you. Um, about wait, 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 wait. Is, is, the, is, the, is the muse that Milton, isn't the muse that Milton invokes in book one when he talks about hell the same as the muse he, he invokes here? Hear my question? Why is he saying now I'm revisiting, the I revisit now, oh, the I revisit now with bolder way. Oh, so maybe you're the same, you're the same use, having escaped the Stygian pool, the long detained in that obscure sojourn while in my flight through utter and through middle darkness born. With other notes, then to the Orphean lyre. What? I sung of chaos and eternal night, taught by the heavenly muse to venture down the dark descent and up to reascend. Though hard and rare, Thee I revisit safe and feel thy sovereign vital lamp, but thou revisitest not these eyes that roll in vain to find thy piercing ray and find no dawn. So thick, thick a drop serene hath quenched their orbs, or dim suffusion prevailed. Wow, that's an amazing description, right? Um, so why, why, why are Milton's, why are Milton's eyes rolling in vain? he's just been in hell so he can't so the light blinds him or that he's literally blind um i think that, good i think i think really that they roll in vain because <laughs> he's literally he's literally blind right, right. also um, i looked at book one invocations are different and the language used is different oh no of course the invocations are different sure mm -hmm. um, but but i think but I think we said, I'm, we're not going to go back there, but I think, I think the implication there is it is also the Holy Spirit as muse. Um, so Milton can't see. Does anybody want to make anything of the Orphean liar? We've seen Milton is kind of obsessed by Orpheus. And Orpheus is a figure for the poet, right? The liar is a figure for poetry. And Milton is saying with other notes than to the Orphean lie. Somebody remind us of the, st the story of Orpheus real quick. And somebody, um, who and somebody who hasn't spoken before, okay? I'm making up new rules for you, Tikva. See, you asked for it. Um, anybody else? Can I, can I do it? Okay, go for it, yeah. Um, Orpheus was a figure of Greek mythology. Um, he was a famous um, musician and poet, and he, um, he was in love with 
a girl, um, I can't remember her name right now. You're a DJ. Uh, Eurydice, is that her? Yeah. Eurydice, I think. Okay, right. Okay. She, uh, she died, and he um, journeyed to the underworld to try to uh, bring her back to life. Mm. Um, and Hades, um, a, he played a song for Hades, the god of death, which made him cry. And then Hades told him that if he went out of the underworld without looking back, um, Eurydice would be um, returned to him. Um, mm he did look back and Eurydice died because he was scared that she wasn't following him. What a weird story. Um, so what, what is implied by the Orphean Lyre? What, what does it mean other notes than to the Orphean Lyre? I mean, I guess the simple meaning is, well, you know, I'm not Greek, right? And C metamorphoses is probably what Zahib, Zahib just paraphrased. Um, so I'm not Greek, that's the first thing. Um, I'm just wondering. Is, is, is it also because Milton doesn't bring anybody out from hell? Is there a parallel there as well? Does that matter? Would that make sense? Orpheus is also one of the most famous um, Greek tragic heroes. Um, okay. But here we're getting, okay, okay. And he, he, Milton doesn't want to associate himself with tragic heroes? Um, maybe. I, I don't know. I, I think this is a place that you could put pressure on if anybody was interested in thinking about, uh, as we said, here's an example of a kind of thing that you could, you could ask questions about on a paper. And one of, the, one of the things that's, there are a lot of Milton scholars, and one of the reasons there are so many Milton scholars, people go into Milton, is by he's a great poet, but there are so many different angles, and Milton it makes himself so available for arguments meaning you can trace the repetition of words or images throughout Milton's poems. And he uses the same kind of image or, or word cluster in many, many different ways throughout the poem. And you can kind of see how the manipulation of certain images allows him to make a certain kind of narrative progress or allows him to comment on the scene. I'm a, one of the words that I always go back to is wandering. Um, there are good times, there are good kinds of wandering in Paradise Lost and there are bad kinds of wandering. And to kind of trace those, um, to trace it through is, is, is easy and, um, or Milton makes himself very accessible to researchers who are researching many, many different things, among them just seeing the way images repeat themselves. Okay, um, with other notes then to the Orphean Lyre, I sung of chaos and eternal night, taught by, sorry, with other notes then to the Orphean Lyre, I sung of chaos and eternal night, taught by the heaven news to venture down the dark descent and up to reascend, though hard and rare. Thee I revisit safe and feel thy sovereign vital lamp. One second, I thought he was blind. But what did you say about the Orphean Lyre? I said, I don't know. I said, I, I, what I asked before is, is Orpheus, how is, Mil is Milton just different that he's a Christian poet and not a Greek poet? Or does he have a different relationship to the hell he just left than Orpheus does? And is that significant? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I actually saw it in a note and I saw I, I was pursuing it. I still don't see why, I don't st still see why that would be something we would, uh, I would pursue, but I'm, I just don't want to think about it more right now. Um, so I thought Milton Maybe, was, yeah. Can I say something? Maybe it foreshadows um, Saturn's end, like how, it's going to end for him. Why? In terms of a frills. Because he will return to hell at the end. Like, he, he's going to sort okay. of um, end up ah. like a frills. Oh, I'm well, just thinking does, out loud. Does Orpheus escape? Does he go? Does he leave hell? Yes, but he, he, uh, he, but he doesn't does. get what he wants. Okay. 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 Maybe, maybe, maybe Satan is also a figure for a certain kind of poetry. Uh, we'll keep our minds open, but let's just go back to the, the question that we can, I think, answer a little bit more, um, um, uh, more richly and successfully. What, isn't he blind? What is he seeing? Thee I revisit safe and feel thy sovereign vital lamp. I guess that must be an inner, an inner world, an inner life? Yeah. He, he feels it, but he doesn't see it. Uh -huh. Right? Because like, then the very next verse says his eyes are rolling in vain and mm -hmm. they do not mm -hmm. find piercing rays.
But that revisited not these eyes, eyes that roll in vain to find thy piercing rain, find no dawn. So thick a drop serene have quenched their orbs or dim suffusion veiled. I think the drop serene is a, a theory about blindness from Milton's time. So Milton can't, I mean, I think he's about, I think he mentions Tiresias soon. Am I wrong about that? Somewhere in this book, I think he either mentioned Tiresias already or is about to mention Tiresias. Oh, here he is. Why would he mention Tiresias here? Tiresias is also a blind. He was blind. A blind, a blind seer. He's not a blind. Right, so there you it's go. A right, so Milton is going is is himself saying. I mean, he's a blind seer. That's a, a good way of putting it. Um, it's also that just like we see in Oedipus Rex, there are different kinds of sight, and Milton is appropriating that dichotomy from Oedipus Rex, the person who sees and the person who doesn't see, um, and he's I guess Christianizing it. Um, or he's certainly using it for his own poetic purposes. It exists in um, it exists in the Tanakh as well. I mean, obviously, Tiresias is Greek, but the blind okay, seer is not. Okay, uh, 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 okay, good. Um, so he's seeing, even though he can't see. Um, and we stopped in the middle of line twenty-six, and he goes on. Yet not the more seaside to wander where the muses haunt clear spring, or shady grove, or sunny hill, smit with the love. Of sacred song. How, Where are you reading? I'm sorry, from line 26 to line 30, um, to line to line 29. Um, yet not the more seaside to wander where the muse, muses haunt clear spring or shady grove or sunny hill, smit with the love of sacred song. How do those three and a half lines come as a kind of qualification? or maybe that's not the right word. How do these, how do these words continue from what came before? Is that question, is that, you hear my question here? <coughs> I mean, there's a sheer, there's a, I'm just asking me just a basic question. There's a clear shift, right? He describes his blindness and then in line 26 to 29, he does something different. I mean, how would you describe what he's doing here and how, is it what we expect? Is it not what we expect? When nobody answers, I have a feeling I'm not asking the question properly. Or you're just very, very tired. Can I call on somebody? Gavi, what do you have any insights on this? No. Or just thinking. You're just thinking. I could uh, maybe just, I, it's random, but I think about the thorn in Paul's flesh, right? Paul had that whatever some some traditions say it was even the ish sight or rather blindness and so okay. paul prays that the lord take this away but he right. receives the message the lord will not because he says that my power is made perfect through weakness so i can maybe understand milton here is taking up his issue okay, his blindness sure, sure. and sure. he and he's saying even though it's not being removed not being taken away yet he persists right to Oh, uh, where's this? Test. Where, where, where do you see the persistence? Uh, that he doesn't cease, not the more seaside. Uh, good, 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 so good, good he, right. He perseveres. Meaning, he, he, meaning you, you would expect almost this to be the end of a poem about blindness, but it's not yeah. the end of a poem about blindness. It's yet not the more seaside to wander where the muses haunt clear spring or shady grove or sunny hill. But he goes on in the, in the next line, lines, and he. I guess gives images, he visualizes. Meaning after this declaration of blindness, Milton declares, first of all, himself as a poet, clear spring, shady grove, sunny hill through those images. And he's still smit with the love of sacred song. What does that mean? What is Milton telling us about himself here? Or what the poet is telling he's us He's talking about, about um, the idea of blind faith. Mm. Right, but the blind faith, blind faith, even in 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 the um, in the muses, how would that represent to his? How would that fit with the his continuation of, yet not the more seaside to wander? And you might say, because his, yeah, his muses are the gods. Uh huh. Well, his muse is a different kind of muse. His muse is the, is like the Holy Spirit. Um. I don't know if I was a very religious Holy Spirit. I would say Milton Dute. You know. That's not what we want from you now. 
or you are saying, but but Shani's saying, oh, the with the love of sacred song, right? Sacred song. It's a different kind of song. Devora, were you going to say something? Yeah. I think the shift in metaphor is quite fascinating. Dvorah, we, because... we, we can't hear Devora because she's her thing is not working. So we'll we'll you, you, you could write it in the chat or try to fix your router. What were you saying, Tom? Let me see. This shift in metaphor from all of the light and sun, all yeah. this visual metaphor, right. and now it shifts to the musical sound metaphor of like auditory. So right. in the auditory, it's like not seen as spirit and God himself is invisible. Mm. Mm -hmm. So okay. there's kind of a depth. You could, or you could say there's a depth uh, mm. happening. We're moving from the visual to the auditory from vision to the auditory that's interesting which is like moving from from flesh to spirit oh, okay that that's really interesting because milton does play a lot around with seeing and hearing but i think i th uh, maybe but i see this book as so much about sight but well, let's see okay um and images yet not the more seaside to wander where the muses haunt clear spring or shady brook or sunny hill smit with the love of sacred song but chief thee zion and flowery brooks beneath that wash thy hallowed feet and warbling flow nightly i visit nor sometimes forget those other two equaled with me in fate so were i equaled with them in renown meaning he's going to compare himself to blind tamaris and blind men maynodes whatever and tiresias and phineas prophets old we could click on the, the names but we're not going to we assume they're all blind prophets and milton is putting himself in their company um then um then he doesn't prophet, choose christian what prophets that? though what, he doesn't that? choose christian prophets right which is also weird right again but and, and he does call them prophets which is also weird right he, he doesn't mention Christian prophets, he mentions Greeks, and then he calls them prophets. And that maybe has something to do with Milton's view of language or view of history, that even though they don't know they're prophets, on some level they are, or they can be recuperated as prophets, even though, as you, started, as you said to start out, they're not prophets, they are seers. They see, they're seers, but he's calling them prophets. So again, this kind of um, appropriation of, of the Greek. Then, Wouldn't that perhaps mean yeah. that to see that um, seeing is prophecy, like, mm -hmm. and that if he's making himself a seer, then he himself is also a prophet, right? And we, I mean, he's equating that, himself with them. And Milton certainly would have been familiar with. I guess, I guess somebody brought this up already, uh, Tom, about the difference between sight and hearing, and that um, certainly the Old Testament or the rabbinic tradition is much more concerned with hearing than with sight, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know how much that yeah, is. Yeah, the like spirit of God, it's, it's always a thing heard, right? When it comes to the prophets, that word of Elohim, thing heard. Well, one of the things that's interesting, just as a quick diversion, just to understand in the rabbinic tradition, when it says face to face, panim al panim, the Aramaic translation of Uncleus, who was always very careful about representation of the divine, is words to words. That is, how does God make himself present in his face to face way? Through language. Right, it's a very Jewish way of thinking. Right, meaning the the the, the constant mediation of the divine. You can even the face to face, which Paul says, no, Paul's face to face is a commentary on the rabbinic face to face. Right, with Paul, you can see face to face. Not now, but at some point. Um, for the rabbis, I don't think it's ever, or if it is ever, we don't care. Um, so. Um, Right, so seeing is, is certainly privileged, and Milton makes a distinction between seeing and hearing. I'll tell you, by the end of Paradise Lost, in books 11 and 12, when Adam and Eve get their history lesson before they get thrown out of the Garden of Eden, first of all, Eve is not allowed to hear, and second of all, Adam doesn't see, he hears. It's only listening, it's only hearing. So there's something about going into the fallen world which pulls you away from sight and towards hearing. So that's part of the context here. Um, then feed on thoughts that voluntary move harmonious numbers as the wakeful bird sings darkly and in shadiest covert head turns her nocturnal note. 
Thus with the year seasons return, but not to me returns day or the sweet approach of even or morn or sight of the vernal bloom or summer's rose or flocks or herds or human face divine. I hear he's doing what we said he was doing up here um, even more aggressively. I can't say that doesn't stop me from being a poet. And here we actually get beautiful images, the sweet approach of even or morn, sight of vernal bloom, summer rose, fox herds, or human face divine. But cloud instead and ever during dark surrounds me from the cheerful ways of men cut off. And for the book of knowledge fair presented, book of knowledge I think is, there are two books, there's the book of, there are two kinds of revelation. What are the two kinds of revelation? Cosmic and, and catastrophic. Well, no, I, that's what I said at the beginning. Right now, I meant here. For Milton, the book of knowledge is, oh. the guys of Revelation, there's either the knowledge of revelation, like, you know, God reveals himself. Oh, to, reason. God reveals himself to Moses, or, or the book of nature. Or nature, right. So here he's cut mm. off from that latter one, the book of nature. Presented with the universal blank of nature's work to me, expunged and raised, and wisdom at one entrance quite shut out. So much the rather thou celestial light shine inward and mind to a, and mind through all her powers irradiate. Their plant eyes, all mist from thence purge and disperse, that I may see and tell of things invisible to a mortal sight. So if, we, so if we see that Milton here is wondering if he can, ex, uh, and um, may I express the unblamed. So here's that, I mean, Milton, Milton is, is simultaneously a poet who feels anxious about representation, but he also, it's, it's like at, at once he has the most chutzpah we can imagine as a poet and the most anxiety. Why both of them? Because he overcomes that anxiety and, and does it anyway. Out of the very depths of his anxiety, he nonetheless represents. He nonetheless feels this mission. So, you know, Milton poets have no, no, no readers, poets or critics have ever seen Milton as humble. And we see he does have the chutzpah to do it that I may say and tell of things invisible to mortal sight. But nonetheless, his own method, he's, he's very, very careful and even expresses this anxiety about representation. Um, I would like to know if uh, his own blindness has anything to do with so much that he speaks about this. Well, what because he was well, already blind, well, right? He was saying? already blind. Right. I say yes. Right. I really right. think that it reflects what uh, he was truly feeling. Mm -hmm. That it was he was exteriorizing his deep feelings. Well, what in a way, he, in, a, his, in a way, his blindness is a kind of manifestation of um, his sense of feeling chosen in a catastrophic way, right? Meaning the civil war, loss, blindness, um, him himself almost being executed, right? Like people forget when they read Milton that if he is trying to justify the ways of God to man, it's not gonna be easy for him. He had a really shitty life. Or, sorry about that. He had a really difficult life. He had a life of, of, of real um, um, tr continued trauma. Right. So I think that's true. And it is a way that he thinks of his chosenness. And at the end of the 17th exactly. century and the end of the 17th century, people will say, oh, yeah, Milton, you were chosen. You were blinded because God punished you for trying to kill the king. Right. So the blindness is never is not for Milton nor for his followers looked at a, as a as a neutral thing. It is a sign. Estelle, you look disturbed. Why, why are you disturbed? No, I'm not disturbed. Sorry. I just, I'm trying well, to like listen, but it's so hard. It's so hard at the end of the day. Okay. So let's, let's take a break now. Um, what time is it? It's like, it's, it's five o'clock now about. Yeah. Five o'clock. Okay, so let's take a break now. Let's take a break for like 15 minutes. I think I just ate a fly. Let's take a, uh, uh, let's take a, 
let's take a break for like 15 minutes. And um, <laughs> here's the choice. So um, I don't think we're, we're not going to really have much, we're not going to have more time than to do like one other major passage. So do we want to do the free will stuff that comes at the beginning where Lilith tries to, 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 you know, square the circle? Or do we want to look at the Satan stuff at the end? I think we have to look at the, the doctrinal stuff. We tried because we did ask that question about God. Um, but just, mm -hmm. but, but think about the extent to which this whole book, when I asked you before, um, is there a way of looking at the books as a whole as having unity? I don't know if we would even expect them to have them, maybe narrative unity. Um, but here, the whole book is about light. Everything is about light. All the images at the end that describe Satan are about light. Everything is about seeing, 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 seeing. Okay, what so What do you mean by, by the, the books being unity? Meaning, do I expect like a chapter of a novel? I would say, oh, it should have unity. I'd say, oh, it began and now it's oh, ending. Oh, okay. for to have okay. like a narrative continuity? Okay, so I'll see you at like 5.30, okay? Okay. Great. Max? Max? I'm just trying to figure out what I'm doing. Tenemos break. ¿Estás por ahí? Ah. Ok, tenemos break de 15 minutos. Ed. Kaya, we can hear you. Yes, Hi, thank you. Um. Let me do this. What happened here? Okay, I can't solve. Okay. Are we back? But once again, I cannot hear you. What, what did I do wrong now? We're so bad. Uh, oh, I think you, they were just on mute. Uh, okay, good. Okay. Um, so let's look at book three. Is that where we were? I, I, I decided, I, we'll, we'll get back to the beginning. We, we do have to read that. But I want, this really kind of follows a little bit from what we've been talking about. Um, let me just see. Hmm. I can't see what I'm doing here. Where where is the line yet never saw? What line is that? Well, you rolled in a white assault. Pardon? Yet never saw. Optic. 590. Oh, there you go. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. Here, okay. So you're Satan, and he's going from, um, he's going from chaos up until heaven. So we're back in this world of, of, of metaphor, but also I just wanted to pay attention to these, Im these, these images of sight here. Then from pole to pole, he views in breath and without longer pause, down right into the world's first region throws his flight precipitant and winds with ease through the pure, and winds with ease through the pure marble air, his oblique way amongst innumerable stars that shone stars distance, but nigh hand seem other world. They speculated during the 17th century about life on other planets. Here Milton is doing the same thing. But nigh hand seemed other worlds, or other worlds they seemed, or happy isles, like those Hesperian gardens famed of old, fortunate fields and groves and flor flory vales, thrice happy isles. But who, who dwelt happy there? He stayed not to inquire. 
above them all, the golden sun in splendor like his heaven allured his eye. Thither his course he bends through the calm firmament, but up or down by center or eccentric hard to tell, or longitude, where the great luminary aloof, the vulgar constellations thick, that from his lordly eye keeps distance due, dispenses light from far. They as they, as they move their starry dance and numbers that compute days, months, and years towards his all cheering lap. I, I admit we're reading a little bit just for the sound here because we're reading too fast, but we'll get to, we'll get to, uh, we'll get to where we need to first. Uh, so, days, months, and years towards his all cheering lamp turn swift their various motions or are turned by his magnetic beam that gently warms the universe. And to each inward part with gentle penetration, though unseen, shoots invisible virtue, very phallic there, even to the deep, so wondrously set to his station right. There lands the field. Here we're going to concentrate now. Ready? There lands the field, a spot like which perhaps astronomer in the sun's lucent orb through his glazed optic tube yet never saw. Some of you have read this with me once before, but even if you read with me once before, it's, it's a passage that's very difficult to read just because it's hard to make sense. And also, and now we have a different perspective on it from book one. Let me just be right side back. You can think about it. Oh, yeah, so anybody have any, um, any insights here about how to read this? So why is it difficult? So we're, we're now, once again, we're in the business now of imagining Satan. All of book one and two seem to be about that. Now we're, now we're imagining Satan and he's lighting upon, he so wondrously was set his station right. So he's stationed in some place. There lands the feet on that spot, even though he's already landed there, but Milton's always playing around with temporality. A spot like which perhaps, those are all like qualifying terms, aren't they? A spot like which perhaps, Milton seems to be stalling here, or at least qualifying, astronomer in the sun's lucent orb through his glazed optic tube. Glazed optic tube? What is the glazed optic tube? The telescope. So the telescope. He's holding the telescope in his hand and I told you had Stanley Fisher just loved this passage. So he would say, you see it, you see it, you see it, you see it. And then by the end of the passage, by line 590, yet never saw. You thought you saw something. I showed you something. You thought you saw something, but you didn't see it. In a way, this encapsulates what we've been talking about up until this point, the way in which Milton gives you images. And I, I, I always talk about the metaphors as lenses and maybe a little bit influenced by, these, by, by this Miltonic perspective that Milton is here giving you a lens and the lens for which he is giving you to understand um, what reading and interpretation is, is itself a lens that is Galileo's telescope, right? So he's handing us Galileo's telescope and through that telescope, we're looking at the fiend we think we see him, but we didn't. Because the metaphor itself, it's like, a, it's like I used this term last time, you guys didn't like it, a, a, self, um, a self consuming artifact, right? You have the image, it's yeah. helping you. You, that was, you didn't like it last time either. You have the image, the image is the artifact, the image, right? That's the mean through which I'm going to be able to see Satan right, through that image. And here, the, the telescope, the guy holding the telescope, if it's us, if it's the reader or somebody implied in, in the passage, we envision Satan, a spot like which perhaps, and see that the extent of the qualification. Go with me, Nagid, that Milton here is talking about seeing an interpretation. There lands the fiend a spot like which perhaps astronomer in the sun's lucent orb. There you go. There is the scene of reading, right? Through his glazed optic tube, a spot like, what does the astronomer actually see? Does he see a spot or a spot like which perhaps? But right? you see the way it's qualified. Through his glazed optic tube. So the first time I see something concrete, the thing I'm actually looking through, and I'm expecting to actually maybe see it. And then the three words, yet never saw. 
Did I see it or didn't I see it? Uh, Professor Cobra, what do you mean by qualification, by qualified? Because you mentioned it. Well, so first up in line 588. A few times. What, right. What do, you mean? what do I mean yeah. by qualification? So by yeah. qualification, I mean what? 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 what see? You know, these are uh, one qualification would suffice. Why does he need to multiply them? Spot like which perhaps. Oh, there you go. Right. I mean, it's. Do I think what qualifiers? he's doing. I think what I think what he's doing is. Let's say, as I'm saying, that he's describing representation. He's describing the extent to what what you think you're seeing. Oh, it's a spot. Right. That's good. Let's end there. Like which perhaps do I see? again? The question is, do I see it or I don't see it? And I think as C is saying, mm -hmm, the like which perhaps even further qualifies it. Remember at the end of book one, and we have this image, we're not sure what we're seeing. And then we think it might be a, an image in a fairy tale of some guy who may be dreaming. And I said to you then, there's that continual mediation. I'm not, I'm not really hearing or seeing the real thing. And here I think as well, Milton is telling us, um, there is that, there is that, not mediation, but just this uncertainty built into represent. Uh, um, what are you seeing? What can I see through that telescope? As I said to you before, the telescope is a lens of a lens. I, if you use, the, if you <laughs> take, on, take a deep breath, it's okay. It's I know I'm being. I know I'm asking a difficult question. I'm going to repeat it. Okay. So a lens of a lens. By what I mean by that is. Um, I call a, uh, a metaphor a lens, and the, the, the metaphor itself for Milton is this lens. I understand uh, what he's saying. It's what you're saying that's confusing me. <laughs> well, good. You, you don't really need me. Um, so um, any, well, any, anybody else? I'm understanding it wrong. If I, what, I'm what, 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 we'll see. What about, the, what, about, what about this idea? Are we seeing him or are we not seeing him? we're seeing something that the astronomer has never seen. Well, no, it's, it's so it's, it's process. Meaning you're looking, you're looking, you're looking, you're looking, you're looking. And then the epic narrator says about this, this version, this moment of seeing yet never saw. Meaning it happened. That's where I was trying to uh, imitate my former teacher. Meaning he would say, I'm seeing it, I'm seeing it, I'm seeing it. And then I get to the line on the bottom yet never saw, you didn't see it. And I'm saying that's and, and I'm saying that's part of Milton's iconoclasm. He represents something, tells you, right? Milton, in many ways, is a kind of literalist. And people said that about him that he was a literalist in reading the Bible. But it so misrepresents what Milton is about, because he gives you so many different lenses, right? As I said, book one and two are so many different metaphors about Satan. And here, I think Milton is kind of demonstrating with this, this image of seeing what you're meant to do with every metaphor. You see it, you see it, you see it, and then it's gone. If it's I, see, I'm not if, following the if, whole if, see it, see it, uh, see it, uh, gone thing. I'm now muting you. I will get, we're gonna, I'm just, is it? we'll get to questions. One second. It's fine to express your frustration, but we're, we're, still, we're still trying to work through it and explain it. Um, He's, yeah. Is he trying to teach about process? Because isn't yeah, he trying so, through his, his writing to create a new viewership and a new type of readers? He's trying to shape his readers. And the, the way he's shaping them is through the process mm, itself. Right. So there is, right. I think that's what, and I think that's why, Tiffany, you said you might have been misunderstanding it because there is this process of going from seeing it and there, you know, we had a, we had a, 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 um, a, a, a colleague in our department who did a lot of cognitive brain studies, whatever, I never understood what she did. But one of the things that she talked about was that we're image hungry, that we like images, right? So Milton satisfies that desire we have for the image while at the same time being an iconoclast. Milton's, pro he's got two, he's got a, I'm saying here, this demonstrates for Milton the, the problem of what he's up to right now. He himself, is a writer and he wants to figure a way of representing things that his reader, that as you just said, Devorah, he's trying to create, can understand it. And from th this metaphor is really talking about that other side, that side of, well, how do we see? How do we interpret? Things are 
they're, they're, they never seem to be, even though they seem to have reality to us, Milton is suggesting, I think, that we also have to in, inhabit a world where no one interpretation or meaning of things or interpretation suffices. You always need another perspective. You always need another perspective. Um, I don't understand how this is connected to the astronomer. So the astronomer, the question is, is he seeing, it's, it's Galileo, by the way, okay? Right. So let's imagine Galileo and he's sitting in Italy. Remember right. also in book one, Milton moves Galileo around. Is he here or is he here? It's the same thing really. But in, 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 in book one, it's Galileo's place, which is moving. Here, the astronomer is just this one person and he's looking, but the image is disintegrating in front of his eyes. Now the question what? is, the, uh, the, uh, where is the uh, image disintegrating in front of his You know what? We're gonna go, I'm going to go one more time, and then, well, if not, we'll, we'll, we'll go over this after class. So again, All right. this is what Tavora said about process, right? Um, through his, uh, there lands the fiend. What am I doing? I'm actually seeing. I'm seeing a spotlight. I'm seeing it, which perhaps astronomer in the sun's lucent orb. He's a sunspot, right? We didn't point that out this time, right? That's the, 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 um, the lucent orb. Um, that they just discovered during this time anyway. So Milton brings that in, that's who Satan is, through his glazed optic tube. So me as a reader, I just participated in the seeing and reading of this spot. Milton hands me the, the, the glazed optic tube. It's almost like I'm Galileo. But up until that word optic tube, I've been seeing the spot. I see it, I'm reading it. I'm watching the image as Milton did it. And then it's not, and then Milton is telling us as readers, yet never saw Meaning, if you think you saw it entirely, if you think you got it, you didn't. Um, can I, can I, yeah. Can I just say something? Because yeah. you seem to be saying that the spot refers to the fiend, but I always thought that the mm. spot is where he landed. Well, that's good also. Okay. And, then, and that would be the sunspot, because later on it says, okay. beyond expression, okay. right. So he's okay. almost like landed on the sun. But that's, right. but he, the, the, I agree with you with the seeing, not seeing, because that spot the astronomer never saw. The astronomer saw sunspots, but not the spot where the fiend landed. Oh, I don't know. I think, I think the spot is, the spot is in the way we read it. That's what we're looking at. But I do appreciate what you said before that. Um, Okay. Oh, okay. So listen, maybe I'm, maybe if you guys think that I'm writing this passage too hard, I, I hear that. But Professor, so, Professor, yeah. so you're saying that the, all the perspective qualify each other, one another? I think Milton is just saying something about the way people look at the world and see the world. We always see things incompletely. We can never see things fully. Language is always just enough and it's not everything. You know, I meant, just an approximation? I, I, just an approximation? Well, right. I, there's a philosopher named Hilary Putnam. I probably quoted to him be you before. He says, enough may not be everything, but enough is enough. So that's a good principle to live by in almost every area, right? But also an in interpretation, meaning Milton, we've seen, never said, remember he says in Aribajitic, a truth once came into the world in her perfect majesty or whatever, in her perfection. And when was that? That's Jesus. But everything else after that is fragments, different perspectives. So I think enough means I'll never, I'll never have everything in this world. That's also what Milton says in Aria You'll never have it all. And that aspiration for everything is in fact, um, it's really, I think from his point of view, A, impossible. And if you do it, it's idolatry. If you say you understand God through, through or whatever he's trying to represent through language and you have it definitively, well, that shows you that by definition, you don't understand what knowledge is because human knowledge will always be incomplete. I guess the kind of cool thing about that is what I'm saying is he does, I'm making him sound like a 21st century relativist, but he's doing all of this in the context of belief, which is very hard, which makes Milton hard for people to understand because on the one hand, he's the biggest skeptic, but he's also, he's faithful, he's a believer. Tom, what are you, what are you thinking, Tom? Yeah, I was just thinking about the Reformation context there when you were talking and what nature of belief he's 
rejecting presumably Catholicism with, with some of its prevailing characteristics. And then, uh, I mean, Protestantism is still this new novel thing that's just snowballing, but also, what, fragmenting. I mean, we know it will happen historically. It's going to shatter into myriad pieces. And he's kind of capturing that essential character of plurality and right 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 i mean um, right so I think he's, yeah he's, well but see milton milton likes you I mean, yeah i mean that's very sensitive i think but milton really likes unity as well meaning there is that emphasis on difference but there is you know he's think i mean we use the metaphor with aria Bajitica, it's discordia concourse it's the holding together of disparate images mm -hmm. um, Anybody else have any comments? Should we move on? Let's move on. Yeah, okay, so, um, well, I still kind of want to do this because it keeps on going, I think. The place he found beyond, exp the place he found, I guess we're talking about Satan now. Professor, Professor who said the Discordia Concord, Johnson? Yeah, the place he found beyond expression bright, right? right? Now Satan is finding this beyond expression. Right, it's bright beyond expression. See, Milton is talking about seeing representation compared with aught on earth, metal or stone. Not all parts like, but all alike, informed with radiant light, as glowing iron with fire. If metal, parts seem gold, parts silver clear. If stone, again that qualification. What is it? Is it this or this? If stone, carbuncle, most or chrysolite, ruby or topaz, to the 12 that shone in Aaron's breastplate. Where are we now? What's Aaron's breastplate? The vestment that he wore when he entered the temple. Okay. The temple. Right, so now, to the 12 that shone in Aaron's breastplate and a stone besides, imagine rather oft than elsewhere seen. So this stone besides, what is that stone? That stone or light to that wood which here below philosophers in vain so long have sought in vain. Wow. It's like all of this is emphasizing the difficulty of possibly knowing anything. Like he keeps on saying, is it stone? Is it ruby or topaz? Or maybe it's something that is more imagined than seen, meaning now it's already in the realm of imagination. That stone, which is the philosopher's stone, which people have been looking for but haven't found, right, in vain. Right? I mean, you, you see the extent to which he's putting whatever we think we're seeing further and further away from us. What is, is the Philosopher's Stone? Oh, what is the Philosopher's Stone? What's the Philosopher's Stone? Oh, you must know. Donna, we're going to ask you. It's Harry Potter. Well, well Donna is, Don is the, the young adult fiction expert here. So we want to hear, what is the Philosopher's Stone? So the myth said, says it can give you eternal life or gold <laughs> so that's uh -huh. like in a nutshell is that what it is in harry potter also <laughs> yes it, yeah. <laughs> it can i mean i think to alchemists it was something that could turn and blood into gold alchemist, which is... right. no not full metal alchemist i mean alchemists in milton's time and now i know <laughs> or, or tick, tick, you're in, you're in very high volume for some reason tick, so can you just lower oh, that a little um, bit I okay don't okay know well, how. well okay um you'll figure it out um question uh, yeah. Uh, would we say that this is quite similar to the oh, right, music you, uh, we, Go ahead, Nathalie. Is this better? Yes. The guys are not familiar. Would we say that this is similar to the views that we've seen him express in Area Pagetica about mm -hmm. not being able to know the full truth yet? And right, right, sure. Okay. Right, so I think that's, I think that Nathanael is saying there's a connection between um, Milton's prose and what he's doing here that and and in both he's thinking about right i mean he's thinking about a pluralism within unity meaning what's the unity paradise lost what's the pluralism all of the images that he gives why does he mention the philosopher's stone now that we know what it is the philosopher's uh, stone makes the imperfect perfect all right so that's also and that's alchemy itself becomes during this period a kind of metaphor for interpretation meaning if i get if i pull the dross or the lead away i can get to the gold right and that's part of the philosopher's mm -hmm. stone it's not only it's going to make gold but i'm going to get to the essence of things 
so that becomes like a metaphor for interpretation. So, but, uh, but this stone, which it holds promise, or like to that which here below, like philosophers in vain so long have sought. Meaning they look for it, but they never found it. So the whole idea of interpretation is being qualified. I mean, I guess as much as Milton is saying, you know, I'm kind of worried about what I'm doing because I might be revealing things that are not, that, that are not visible to mortal sight. And he says later on, perhaps not lawful to reveal. Perhaps I shouldn't do it. And I guess maybe part of that anxiety is because he sees that reading is very difficult. For people to read properly is difficult. Um, so the poem, the poem is kind of a philosopher's stone? Uh, yeah, that sounds like a great a title for a, a, a paper at the Modern Language Association. Meaning, yeah, but you'd have to you'd have to flesh it out a lot. It sounds really interesting. Um, but yeah, to use the poem is why did you say that? See, why why do you use it? Because he tries to uh, to make this uh, uh, very these good. base base words into uh, precious words. I don't know. Right, right, right. And I think also you might be saying that he's he's. Part of part of what he's trying to get the do to, uh, is to try to use his the alchemy of his poetry to get to make a good reader. That's that's part of your paper at the Modern Language Association. Um, May I say half a sentence about the breastplate? Yes, please. So um, the the breastplate that Aaron has has many. Um, sorry if I'm still loud. Try and speak yes. more quietly. Um, he, it has 12 different stones and they're very distinct from each other. And this could be also another one of those bringing things that are different and making them one whole. And also it was, it was used for divination, kind of seeing the future. Again, referring to that seer thing, possibly, I'm not sure how much of that is Jewish conjecture and how much okay, of that is. Okay, okay, okay. You're just saying a lot, so let's just, let's, um... I think the important bit is the different stones and the bringing different right. things well, into the whole. So that that's certainly true, and also the way in which somebody's got to turn their thing off. The way in which um, um, Milton is using these very different kinds of metaphors to describe Satan. Right here, Satan is being compared to the ornament to me. Okay. Um, Can I make a quick comment about the stone? Yes, please. I, somebody's volume is really annoying me. What is the? Who is that? Is that me or is that who just turned their volume off? I don't know. Somebody, whoever did that, that was it. Okay, so yeah, what, Rina? So is it possible that this, those stone that they can't, if they look for it, they look for it, no matter how much they look, they won't find it. Is that mm. perhaps a bit like the yet never saw? And even though you think you're seeing it, you're not. And so just like you're looking for a stone, you're not going to find it. Well, so even I mean, if you keep trying to see, you won't necessarily see it if you can't be seen. Right, well, I don't, I don't, I mean, I think it may, may be two different things. I was understanding the yet never saw more as you have that image in hand and it's not well, it's a little bit different that you did, you actually saw it and you had a clear picture of it. But if you think that's what it actually is, though, you're wrong. Yet never saw you didn't, you did because you didn't see it. And you're saying that the it's image. It's like a process of, thing? I, I think so. I think so. Um, did, did that make sense? Oh, just we're, what, uh, can you just follow up a little bit so I can understand a little bit more what you're asking? I, I, I mean, I know the difference between seeing and looking. They're different verbs, right? But they are kind of similar with the whole sight, with involving sight. And when we were discussing how they're all looking for the stone, right, and right, right. they're seeking it, and they won't, they can't find it. Right. And it I, I just, I just wonder, similar, I, but no, perhaps for I sure. misunderstood what you no, said for before. Sure. No, 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 for sure it does sound similar. But I think for Milton, there's always the possibility of getting something. So I'm not so sure about, I mean, I think the, the searching for the Philosopher's Stone does demonstrate this failure of sight. Um, okay, so let's, let's skip now, go back to our discussion of free will. I said we were going to do that. Um, I did want to just emphasize that really, just as Renat said, because I wanted to show the kind of continuity between what we were doing this morning uh, this morning, the first part of class, and, and now. Okay, hear a little kids crying, right? Okay. So now we're in line 56. Now had the Almighty Father, from above, from the pure Empyrean where he sits, high throned above all height, bent down his eye, his own works and their works at once to view. About him, all the sanctities of heaven stood thick as stars, 
and from his sight received beatitude past utterance somehow they're getting they're they're getting their beauty from his sight on his right the rate you see there, there you see the emphasis on light and sight in both parts of what seem like very different parts of this book um, on his right the radiant image of his glory sat his only son this is a christian view a christian version of the olympian mount right instead of the olympian gods we have the, the father and the son by his side on earth he first beheld our two first parents you wonder what first means in these lines i mean i know first parent uh, uh, first parents what that means what do you mean on earth he first oh he first beheld them on earth he first beheld our two pair first parents is this the first time he's seen them yet the only two of mankind in the happy garden placed reaping immortal fruits of joy and love uninterrupted joy unrivaled love in blissful solitude are things good for Adam and Eve and Eden? Mm -hmm. Sound pretty good, right? In blissful solitude, he then surveyed hell and the gulf between and Satan there, coasting the wall of heaven on this side night. In the dun air, in the dun air sublime and ready now to stoop with wearied wings and will willing feet on the bare outside of this world that seemed firm lamb embosomed without firmament uncertain which in ocean or in air him god beholding from his prospects high wherein past present future he beholds thus to his only son foreseeing spake can you tell me what what happens on line 70 and then what happens in line 77 meaning i think there's a shift between line 69 and 70 and a shift between um Seventy-six to seventy-seven. Do you, do you think? Do you see the difference in style? Like what happens on line seventy? He's before that he's surveying earth and heaven, and after that he's surveying hell. And then, so well, I'm at, oh, good. So what about what about the poetic strategy here? How is the poetry different? I mean, also think of the transition from 76 to 77. It's weird. Do you, do, do, I, I'm, I'm kind of reading it as a, like, um, like a, a change in speaker almost. Like to me, it's like a dialogue, a back and forth. Do you guys not see that? Yeah, 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 there is a... It's what, Simpler oh, language, it's much more. There's a, yeah, there's a change in, in the choice, right. in the word choice. Yeah, like we were saying before, um, that Satan gets all the good lines as soon as, it's, it's not that Satan gets all the good lines, Satan gets all the good descriptions, right? So all of a sudden, as you said, uh, Alana, we're in hell again. He then surveyed and the gulf between and Satan, they're coasting the wall of heaven on this side night in the dun sublime and ready now to stoop with wearied wings and willing feet on the bare outside of this world that seemed firm land embosomed without firmament uncertain which in ocean or in air and there's all this doubt about where heaven where satan is going to end up but when we see satan i'm going to keep on using this metaphor through the lens of coasting the wall of heaven on this side night in the dun air sublime i mean how does how are we, how is Milton, by giving us this metaphor, asking us to relate to Satan here? Through God's perspective. Um, everybody agrees with C? I mean, I agree. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm being a high school teacher now. I, I mean, everybody, I mean, I would think that everybody would agree that here C is right. Him, God beholding from his prospect high. But I think up until there, it's like a different perspective, meaning we go from all of this very simple language as you talk about it, 
that's that's the divine language and it represents the divine and then we and, and his perspective which we'll see more of at the end and then we get satan almost like from his perspective i'm just what does it mean to coasting the wall of heaven what kind of metaphor is that zahavit yeah you're stretching oh okay somebody i just like i like everybody to participate because i know you're still alive and see, I, know, I see I know more from his voice than from his, his actual appearance. <laughs> um, anybody? Somebody, Ben? You're asking about the verb coasting? Yeah, what, yeah just like, what is, this, what is this image of? Coasting the wall of heaven, take for you know what it is? It sounds like the dividing line between mm. light and darkness. Right. Like a Again, day and a night. Right. But this it's, right, it's this reminding me of Icarus. I guess this coasting, it's like all the, you know, from, from, uh, from the divine perspective, Satan is really nothing. But here he's kind of coasting. And I think it suggests speed and movement and ease. And it gives him a kind of autonomy or agency that all of a sudden, just from that description, He's a character, as, as Avid said, he, he develops. We see him moving, coasting the wall of heaven on this side night in the dun air sublime. And it's very romantic and heroic and ready now to stoop with wearied wings. So the same, this idea of readiness that he is going forward to stoop with wearied wings and willing feet on the bare outside of this world. So it seems almost like there are two narratives here. Not only do we get a change in metaphor, but the metaphors themselves suggest a different kind of narrative. In Satan's world, he is an agent. He is a, to continue the literary metaphor, he is a writer. He writes his own story. And what's his story? What's the, what's the story that he's in right now? What is the story that he thinks he's about to enter into? Let's give it a title. The Unseating of God. Uh, okay, I, I, would, I would make it a little bit more local. How about the tragedy of Adam and Eve? That, and, and, and that's what he's, that's the play he's about to enter into. And why it's a tragedy is because as Tikva says, it's going to, it's going to bring, it's going to prove that God is not God. So Satan feel, I mean, it's almost, and I think this is the way to think about it in generic terms. Um, I see it almost like, like in an action movie, that when we go, when we see Satan, there's suddenly that possibility that, well, maybe he will win. Right, this kind of threatening image of a figure who is involved in a narrative. And we're wondering, well, what's the outcome going to be? But by the time I get to line 77, and this description of God is with a reason, him beholding, that's the divine perspective, from his prospect high where in past, present, future he beholds. Why is that important? Why, do we, why does Milton emphasize this temporal aspect of the divine here? right after the satanic metaphor. He's well, convinced God's narrative is the bigger one. Yeah, right. So Satan is involved in the tragedy of Adam and, and, of Adam and Eve. And he thinks that's the end. Ta-da! Written by Satan. Satan. But what, get, what gets asserted here at the end? There's another providential narrative in which Satan is, or, is always already contained. Like yeah. he, thinks, he thinks he's writing his own story. And, and this will get into our whole question of agency in Milton. He thinks he has agency, but he doesn't. He thinks he's independent, but he isn't. So, and also we have this is kind of Milton's sense of humor. Thus to his only son foreseeing spake. You will not see that um, descriptor used for any other speaker. So to his son only foreseeing spake. So um, let's con we'll continue a little bit more. We'll see the, the, here Milton is going to try to deal with this idea of, well, how is it that um, man has free will if in fact, God's narrative is already written. And that aspect of the divine that knows past, present, and future has already just been emphasized. So now the question is, well, if God knows everything, what room is there for free will? 
So he's about to deal with this problem. We've mentioned it several times already. Um, only begotten son, seest thou what rage transports our adversary? Whom no somebody's uh, uh, background noise. Whom no bounds prescribe, no bars of hell, nor all the chains heaped on him there, nor yet the main abyss wide interrupt can hold. Wow, that's weird also. Because here, how is God, try how is God describing Satan here? Uh, unbridled how do you say it Un right i mean un it's almost like he's describing um the son in in narrative terms meaning like in the terms that were that we looked at that almost as if he's looking at it from satan's perspective that he's unbridled he can't be held back there are no bars of hell nor yet the main abyss wide erupt can hold i always think of this this part of of this uh, this um, this narrative part of Paradise Lost is kind of like a suspense novel, meaning it's obviously not a suspense novel, but there's this sense of this uncertainty about what will happen. The, right, yeah, what? Show against the um, omnipotence of God. What's that? Does it yeah. go against the idea of the omnipotence of God? Well, so yeah, well, that's right. And that's part of but Satan nonetheless thinks that he can narrate himself. It's like um, God is giving him enough rope to hang himself. Pretty much, let's see what, I think Milton uses that metaphor, yeah. Um, so, but here it seems that even, Mike, I would just add, I think it's very important this is a dramatic situation. God is speaking in this way and representing Satan in this way because he's talking to Jesus. Now, I was talking to Tikva about this earlier today, and I know you might not care about this or think you don't care at all about this, but Milton thought that Jesus was a created being, right? I mean, like all of Mil so Milton's theology and his poetics, they all line up in very interesting ways. Um, I see Devorah is already yawning, like I'm now gonna care about the, the Christian, the, the details of Christian theology. I really hear that, but it is, it is interesting. Why would it make a difference if God is talking to somebody who is co-eternal, meaning the Trinity exists forever and they're all equal partners, right? In this, the God and the Son are not equal partners. They're not. Jesus is created. And that's why God taught, uses these metaphors with, in relationship to Jesus, because he's actually trying to convince him to do something. And, and that requires rhetoric. You'll see. So bent he seems on desperate revenge that shall redound upon his own rebellious head meaning no matter what bad he does, good will come out of it. And now through all, and now, through all restraint broke loose, he wings his way not far off heaven and the precincts of light directly towards the new created world. Right, I'm biting my nails. Is he gonna get there? And man there placed with purpose to essay to try, if by force he can destroy or worse by some false guile, pervert and shall pervert for man will hearken to his glozing lies and easily transgress the sole command, sole pledge of his obedience. It sounds like God's a little bit down on man in this passage, right? Um, tell me, what, why is there, there's a change in, in, um, in intense here. If by force he can destroy or worse by some false guile pervert, maybe it's not intense. So I'm, I'm just, I guess I'm asking you, and I've, some of you have asked this question before, what does the semicolon achieve in this, in this poetic line? Why does Milton put it there? And, and how does it perhaps, how does it perhaps rep represent the, the temporal views that we've been talking about? From what, per, from, what per, from what perspective is it, if by him by force he can destroy or worse by some fa false guile pervert, before the semicolon is conditional? I think the if, the if accommodates the free will, men's oh, free will, and the okay. shall accommodates the predestination, mm -hmm. the omniscient. Yeah. That's good, right? So the the in in I, I think it accommodates free will. Um, 
it also, before the semicolon, I kind of feel that sense of, you know, Satan's agency and his aspiration to pervert. But at, after the semicolon, and shall pervert, as C just said, you have this, you know, God already knows everything. God's, you're, or, you're already in another story. So I think in a way, I would say it a little bit differently. And please interrupt me if, 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 if need be. I think this accommodates temporality and process, and this accommodates God's all-knowing. That Milton gives us both in, 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 the, in, 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 in the same line. I mean, for man will hearken to his glozing lies, glozing meaning deceptive, and easily transgress the soul command. We'll notice also that Satan's temptation to Adam and Eve is thought of in poetic terms, meaning glozing. What does glozing mean here? Flattering, cajoling, or perverting. Satan uses the tools of rhetoric. He uses language in a perverse way, and that's how he tempts Adam and Eve. Um, and how does he, the yes. Sorry, how does, how does the first part accommodate free will? Um, I, I, so I think the note, there's just the condition. We don't know what's going to happen. I might do this, I might do this. Mm -hmm. so Maybe successful, may not be successful. After the semicolon, we know already. I right? see. Right, and, and, and I've been talking about this, like those narratives, Milton just switches them back and forth all the time, right? And I, so we have to understand, one of the things, like as readers, why does Milton do that? Why does he disrupt us in that way? Or why does he ask us to see two things at a time or two times at a time? Well, I think it's, like you said, it's partially to, to explain divine, the, what's it called, it? preordination and um, free will. I know that um, when, when Professor Pearl explained it to us, um, it was like, we are walking through a maze. And God is seeing the maze from above. Right. Okay. No. So we don't know where we're going. Right. I, think I, must, I think I once used the metaphor of like a bicycle wheel for you, just a part of the bicycle wheel. And that there's the, there's the, the spur at the center and this past, present and future is like this. So from the, from the middle, you can, see the, you can see all of history at one time. Good. I like Professor Meta, Pearl's metaphor as well. Yes, Devorah. Uh, is it also saying that there's no way we can ever see every single perspective? And maybe that's just reserved for God? Um, and we're never going to be like that because there's always more to see. Well, that I think is also true, right? And I think that's a, that's a statement about about reading that you can never see. That's the weird thing. In a way, Milton wants us to understand the divine perspective at the same time that he tells us you can never have that perspective. You can't occupy that perspective, as you just said, right? You'll never get there, but you can get like an approximation of it, maybe, right? You can never get there, but that doesn't mean you aren't obligated to try. Uh, okay, you're, you're, uh, we're not, it's not perky of both, but I get what you mean, yeah, yeah. Um, um, and, like and I think more than anything, and more than anything about yeah. trying to be God, it's about the process of trying to understand. I think that's maybe also what he's trying to say. Right, I mean, it's, we're getting a lot, condensing it a lot into this one line, but I think so. Um, so here we get to the, here we get to the, uh, the other question that you, you have been raising. I mean, more very explicitly about about a free will, but also reward and punishment. So will fall he and his faithless progeny. A lot of William Emerson doesn't like this, right? This is this is God talking about man. How does God talk about man? So will fall he and his faithless progeny. Whose fault? Who's to blame? Who's but his own? Ingrate. Not very nice, is it right? That's how God talks to man. Ingrate, he had of me all he could have. I made him just and right, sufficient to have stood, though free to fall. Why is Milton so mean? Why is Milton's God so mean? Dude, chill out. I have this theory now, and I hope I'm not offending anybody. I might offend people. It's not the Jews that created um, the Old Testament God. I mean, that's obvious. It's the Christians that create the Old Testament God. In Milton's Trinity, the father has to be a badass because the son is love, right? So the son is, the father is represented in much more stern terms than God is in the Old Testament, right? And, and the father is associated with the Old Testament God. Did I offend anybody? You understand what I just said? 
Tom, you got what I said? Can you repeat what you said? I'm just yeah. saying. I'm just saying in the in the Christian tradition, where Mil Milton makes the Old Testament God really bad, it, and the reason that the Old Testament God is really bad is not because the Old Testament. Let's put it this way: be more scholarly. The God of the rabbis is based upon a very different reading of Tanakh than the God of the Christians, the Old Testament God of the Christians. That is, the rabbis construct their own conception of the divine on the basis of the Tanakh. The Christians, they construct their own conception of the Old Testament God. But because there's a dichotomy in Christianity between law and mercy, or justice and mercy, they're different persona, because of that, um, I'm in the middle of a very important thought. I just get distracted from other people's children are distracting me. What, 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 where, where am I? That we have Jesus and, all oh, right. So There's a Christian dichotomy. Right, that, right, because of that dichotomy, you have to displace justice onto the Father. All of the justice goes onto the Father. Meaning God, Jesus is, so, is the figure of mercy so God is, is rendered much more associated with an unforgiving law. That, that's, I mean, I think that comes a little bit through with Milton as well. Um, because he's, this is a very, this is a kind of nasty God, isn't it? Ingrate, he had of me all he could have. What did God give man? We're ingrateful about. I made him just and right sufficient to have stood though free to fall. What does that mean? Milton. I made him strong enough to withstand temptation and then he fell for temptation anyway. I made you free. You were sufficient to have stood and a standing is another word that gets repeated again and again in Paradise Lost. You're sufficient to have stood upright but you're also free to fall. I gave you the capacity to act freely. Oh, no, what is, what is sufficient to have stood mean actually? You could have, you could have, you could have, you could have done it. What were you I gave you enough morality to, to have been good, but I also gave you enough free will that if you wanted to, then you yeah. could. Yeah. We'll that. Yeah, go ahead, Ben. Yeah. In other words, the capacity to withstand the seductions of books one and two, but they just couldn't do it. Well, you're talking about us as readers or us or, or Satan or the or Satan who's fall. The, the, I don't know, does he say the same thing about, oh, oh, he says the same thing about, so good, Ben, I wasn't following. So he's, Milton will go on to say the same thing about the angels, that it's not only Adam and Eve who are sufficient to have stood the free to fall, but also the satanic angels that also fell. So there's the sufficiency to stand, and I don't think it's morality, Zavid, I think it's more, I think it's more reason, meaning it's not such, it's not a formal body of knowledge, it's reason which should tell you to obey God. And it's just it's, like, I guess- It's not willpower? It's gotta be the will there also, but it's primarily Milton, I think we'll talk about reason. Sufficient to have stood though free to fall. Such I created all the ethereal powers and spirits, both them who stood and them who failed. Yeah, you're right about it. It always say it stands to reason. You know, there is this phrase, stands okay. to reason. Freely they stood who stood and fell who fell. I mean, I, I kind of, I don't, I hear Milton at like the Cambridge Debating Society trying to make the point as strongly as he can. And he just, and he's doing his best because in a way he's, in a way he knows this argument is impossible. Do you, do you acknowledge that also, that this is an impossible argument to make? That you can't both, as, or am I wrong about that? Can you say that people have free will with God knowing what you're going to do? It's like one of those um, make your own story books. What do you, you can mean? Go on, um, like you can choose if oh. you want to go right or left, go to page 10. If you go right. right, go to page 11. If you go left. So all the possibilities are there. Wow. God may know which one you're going to choose potentially. It's all written. The book was written with all the options in it. You can choose A, B, or C, or wow. however many options there are with free. You can choose to go on the path to where you to have stood with reason, or you could choose the path where you fall. Way to use those, that is an amazing metaphor that you just used there, way to bring the video games into Milton. Right, so, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, okay. 
I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not blown away. I mean, I'm blown away by your use of the metaphor, but I'm not so convinced. Maybe it's a question of perspective, like from God's perspective, everything is written, but from Adam's perspective, he has free will, he can choose. I mean, you know, you just like said the problem in another way. I mean, to me, right? I mean, I, I um, Chaya, you were gonna say something. Come on. So every, somebody must be tempted here because everybody has a rabbi who one morning decides that he's going to talk about this and then, and then make some people think they understand it, right? It's, it's an so eternal that, discussion. It's an, it's eternal, an eternal discussion. What do, you, what do you mean by that, by saying it's an eternal discussion? Well, it comes up all, over, all, all the time, the same thing. No? Well, so that why does it It's okay. about free will. Okay, what so, is exactly uh, what what is free will? I Who think, controls it? Do we control? Do we really control uh, our free right. will? I mean, that is, it happens also in in secular context without the without a exactly. religious context. Um, yeah. and, and that um, somebody else, Tom, you had a comment. Yeah. Yeah, I think we'll get a more compelling and, and real discussion is the reason faith. Because when we get into God, God's omniscience. I feel like that just ultimately comes down to how you value volition. One person, you like for me, it's right. You valued what? I mean, the issue of God's omni omniscience. So then, okay, yeah. God knows. But I, I think that one is a little, uh, it just comes down to how much you want to value it, will, volition. Where it's more real on a human level. Mm. is you get many traditions, the philosophic, perhaps more Catholicism, I can't say exactly, right. but the emphasis on reason suggests that the human flaw is in reason, and then the okay. path of salvation becomes education. Oh, but then okay. you get yeah, a yeah. whole separate, I, I, I you mean, get you a separate tradition, right, a volitional tradition that says, no, it's not an issue of reason, of which yeah. we are, to quote, sufficient to stand. Yeah. So therefore, Education is not the issue at hand. Okay. Education is not the okay. solution. Okay. It's, so this is the volition tradition. It's saying the problem is okay. the human okay. good, heart. Good, 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 good. I mean, I really like what you're saying. And I mean, I, yeah, it's volitional because Milton is trying to save free will. And there are Calvinists who are, who were not interested in that so much. But I, I, I just think anybody, I think you're just fetching a little bit. But like some people can say, like, what does knowledge mean? Is knowledge predetermining, right? I mean, there's all sorts of kind of fetches you can make to make the argument go away. But I think ultimately, I would even go back to what Alana says, which in a way is a restatement of the, uh, the question. But there are these different narrative frames in which people exist, in which, and we just saw them demonstrated in the first part of, of this book, shall, shall, and, oh, you know, if and shall, meaning even there, we see those two temporal perspectives. Isn't this so, also... So we, live in, we live in one, and yet we acknowledge there's a divine one. It doesn't really answer the question. I mean, I think, yeah, go ahead. Talking about um, some, one of the other lessons about poetry being able to deal with paradox. Okay, this right, right. So, right. Okay, right, so the, good. Um, so we just have to see, I, I still hear Milton kind of slamming on the, the lectern. Let, let's see, let's read a little bit more. Um, okay, so he says, freely they stood who stood and fell who fell. Not free, and here he gets into this kind of like philosophical back and forth. They stood, uh, not free, what proof could they have given sincere of true allegiance, constant faith or love where only what they needs must do appear, not what they would. What praise could they receive? What pleasure? I from such obedience paid. So what's, what's, what's the argument that Milton here is making for like almost a necessity of free will? That you need to suffer maybe? Not to suffer exactly, but if you have all your needs met and everything's great and perfect, why would you have that kind well, of faith well, what, and obedience? Only, if you only have one option, how can your actions be valued? Ah, so maybe it's an issue not only of suffering, but of really reward and punishment here, right? Meaning if there is a system of reward and punishment, let's say there are certain rules and there's a system of reward and punishment, if there's no free will, 
how, how is there any possible justice in that? Meaning if you are predetermined, as Tom said, as some Protestant Calvinists say, or whatever, they also have to fetch. Um, if some Calvinists, as some Calvinists say, well, how does, what is reward and, how do you make sense of reward and punishment? I imagine that's very difficult for Calvinists to, to deal with. Meaning if you believe in, you know, in a really strong sense of predestination, well, what about, you know, what, how does re, uh, um, um, a reward and punishment make sense? And what is a Calvinist? Uh, somebody who believes in predestination, strong in that direction. So if there's no choice, then what does it matter? What, what do you mean? If there's no choice, if you can't make a choice, then if your choice doesn't affect things, so yeah. well, what's the point of life, really? Did you have Professor Kramer yet and do American literature? Because he knows a lot about Calvinism, right? Yeah. I mean, so we I would... didn't have Professor Kramer, but we did do American lit. Right. Well, Professor Kramer is like, is, like, Professor Kramer turns into a 17th century Calvinist when he teaches. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting. You no, know, he really, so you know, I don't, I mean, I'm a Miltonist, so I know much more of what Tom was calling this volitional tradition, which he means reason choosing. How the, how the Calvinists deal with that issue, that's not our problem for the moment. But no, that, because Milton's fight now is how is he gonna maintain free will and this idea of an all knowing God. Um, so he says, what pleasure I from such obedience paid when will and reason, so there is T uh, Tikva's will, will and reason, reason also is choice, useless in vain of freedom both despoiled, made passive both, had served necessity, not me. If they hadn't, if they didn't have free will, what would it mean? They would be made passive both, had served necessity, not me. What's just a paraphrase of that line? I mean, Adam will say a version of this. I'm saying that they have to choose to serve me. Right. Uh, Adam, will say a ver Adam will say a version of, of this in, in, in book nine. The devil made me do it, right? I, I had no free will. I had served necessity. Didn't, didn't do it myself. God is saying that his world is dependent upon this. Upon Service and freedom are inextricable. What's that? Service and freedom are inextricable. That this is this is precisely a, a very good way of articulating it, and that's probably a wonder, right? So here you do have early modern ideas of freedom starting to be articulated, and for Milton, it's still in the it is still in the framework of service, not like Locke or the uh, the founding fathers, although they might be service as a citizen, but not divine service. Um, yeah, right. So right. Um, they, fair, they therefore, as to right belonged, so were created, nor can justly accuse their maker, or their making, or their faith, as if predestination overruled their will, disposed by absolute decree, or high foreknowledge. It's like Milton is like a contemporary theologian, like he's quoting all these different theological ideas. What, what, will, what will Adam, remember what, remember, how does Orestes re, uh, react to Zeus in the Odyssey? Oh my God, what's he talking about? How does, how does Orestes react to Zeus? Not Orestes, Aegisthus, sorry. How does Aegisthus react to Zeus in the, in the Odyssey? We need to jog our memory. <laughs> um, how did, um, remember like at the very beginning, Athena says, I understand why you're punishing Aegisthus, but why are you punishing Odysseus? Just, as Zeus says, he remembers, Aegisthus came and complained to me, but, I told him, if you don't do the right thing, I'm going to punish you, right? And in a way, that's what, um, what Milton is doing here is the same thing that Athena asks in the Odyssey. Remember, Athena asks uh, 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 Zeus, why, do, why is a bad person, a good person, suffering so much? I Meaning he's asking that question of theodicy. So Milton's God is saying, you know, if, if everything is preordained, then you can't have any kind of meaningful free will. Did that make sense? Aegisthus, he complains about God. And here, Milton's God is saying, don't, don't make that excuse. Nor can justly accuse their maker. Don't accuse me later on. I made you the right way. Or their making, or their fate. As if predestination overruled their will, disp disposed by absolute decree, or high foreknowledge. Don't give me any of that, says Milton's God. They themselves decreed their own revolt, not I.
So he's yeah. saying you have to take responsibility for your actions, essentially. He, right. You can't blame it on God if you sin. Right. So, but now, right, that's the strong emphasis. But now I have to save, I have to save God's foreknowledge here, right? So here, it's interesting. He says, if I foreknew, meaning somebody in the audience is going to say, well, how can they have free will if you foreknew? And if you foreknew, how is their free will meaningful? If I foreknew, foreknowledge had no influence on their fault, which had no less proof certain unforeknown. What? What does that mean? They themselves decreed their own revolt. Note, that, note this idea of decree here, that, that Milton is appropriating the language of decree for free will. They themselves decreed their own revolt, not I. If I foreknew, foreknowledge had no influence on their fault, which had no less proved certain unforeknown. Somehow a, it does, yeah, go ahead. There's a separation between God's knowledge and their actions, i.e. Yeah. just because God knows doesn't mean that their actions are affected by it and he doesn't influence their actions and their actions are not influenced by his knowledge. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, is, I'm, I'm not convinced by, uh, should I be convinced by this argument? I don't, is Milton convinced by this argument or is he, as you said, just posturing a, 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 a presenting a view? I don't know. I'm not, I'm not, I, know. I, I, think it's, I think this is pretty authoritative. If I were to talk about like the providential, you know, uh, heartbeat of the poem, meaning where you find like the doctrinal heartbeat of the poem, it's here. Meaning this is like where Milton explain, gives you like the caption for everything else. So I, 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 would want, I, I wouldn't want to get rid of that not to know too quickly. I'm kind of invested in that reading at the moment. Um, it's, yeah. It's yeah, Alan? to me a little bit like Schrodinger's cat. Well, the cat's in the box. It's either alive or not alive. And it's only when it happens that you know what's going to be. Only when you open the box, then you know if the cat is alive or not alive. But while it's there, you don't know. So that's sort of like what it seems to me when he says certain unknown. Like even... Yeah. I, I just love, I, you, this is definitely a modern language association paper. Does everybody know what Schroeder, Schroeder's cat is? Yeah, more or less, but it's, it's really just, I mean, without going all into it, it it's, it's a, a, a kind of thought experiment which, pro which proves the uncertainty principle that you can't know something, I think, right? Or, or that something can exist in one state and the opposite state somehow at the same time. I love that, but I don't see it here. What do you mean? Well, it's because of the way he says, which had no less proved certain unforeknown. Like that it's not known, it can't be certain when it's not known, but then when, it's, when it happens, then it, I don't know, that's my association with that line. Oh, okay, that, I think, I mean, I, didn't, I don't really understand those lines, and maybe that's part of what you said earlier, that at a certain point your thought gets perplexed and you can't think further, and that's what you have to settle with. Foreknowledge had no influence on their fault, which had no less proved certain unforeknown. Ha okay. Anybody like, else? Anybody else have any comments or responses to this? Not certain when it's unforeknown. Uh, okay. I right hear. Anybody else convinced, not convinced? I mean, surely this is an issue that people talk about and think about, right? Does Milton help you think about it at all? Boy, I wish I could just like, I wish the technology were such where I could like put intravenous coffee into you now. Yeah, I think uh, <laughs> going back to the, the volitional, traditional, volitional perspective, I think yeah. poetry, yeah. I think the poetic medium really lends itself because what, what are we contrasting it to? Reason tradition. And reason has much less need of poetry, right? Okay. I mean, yeah. it's like uh, philosophy. Okay. Yeah, okay, but but, but, but Mills is. The, and yeah. see, here's the problem. I've heard the volume argument in philosophy, and it always falls flat because I think the will needs poetry. Needs this kind of a construal. Uh, okay, you know? I, I, you're, you're, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of half following, but and, and maybe we'll talk at the end of class. But let, let's, uh, let's just read a little bit more because it is getting late. 
Uh, if I for new, for knowledge had no influence on their fault, which I know is proof certain on full knowledge. So with at least impulse or shadow of fate or ought by me immutable, immutably foreseen, right? Nothing that I saw could have been immutably for it was immutably foreseen. If it were immutably foreseen, it would have had to happen. How can it be foreseen and not immutably foreseen? I don't know. They trespass, they trespass authors to themselves and all. It's interesting when Milton gives, or Milton's God gives Adam and Eve authorship, it's when they sin, both what they judge and what they choose. For so I formed them free and free they must remain till they enthrall themselves. I must else, in ch I must, else must change their nature and revoke the high decree unchangeable eternal which adorned their freedom. This is kind of beautiful, really. I mean, Milton is taking this idea of the decree, and the decree is meant to emphasize the lack of free will. And here Milton's God is saying, I else must change their nature. If, 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 if they not being free would mean changing their nature, I else must change their nature and revoke the high ordinance of decree, unchangeable, eternal, which ordained their freedom. What for Milton's God is the unchangeable, eternal, high decree? Freedom. Freedom. Right, right? Which, is, which is exactly the opposite of how it should be thought about. There's the decree which organizes history and time and makes everything organized, but Milton's high decree, very inspiring, it's freedom. But in, in what sense is he revoking it? Pardon? Where is, I mean, revo where, where is revoking? Oh. I also... I, 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 Oh, if, if I if I change the only way I could change you is by undoing a decree. It's oh, like it's yeah, it. it's like reason is for Milton a law of nature. Okay. Right? It's like it's like a chok, as <laughs> as uh, in, a, in in Jewish world, you know, the chok is not something you question; it just exists. No reason; it's just there. And Milton's chok is reason. Well, like the an chok, axiom. Yeah. Yeah, please, sir. So yeah. No, I just said it's like an axiom. Yeah, the first sort by their own suggestion fell. That's, that's the angel, self-tempted, self-depraved. Man falls deceived by the other first. Mercy, therefore, shall find grace, the other none. In mercy and justice both, though heaven and earth, so shall my glory excel. But first, mercy first and last shall brightest shine. Nice. Want another word that gets repeated many times over in Paradise Lost is uh, in book three is, is grace. I think it's many, many times. Grace, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. That's a lot, right? Um, yeah, go ahead, uh, uh, Alana, yeah. In a way, freedom is the greatest gift that God gave man. Because yeah. it, it's what gives us the opportunity to find grace. It's, it's what, yeah. you know, oh, makes life interesting. I mean, it's sort of like what separates us from animals who work only through instinct. But man... Uh, okay, has, go, go, go. So, I mean, you, you, you sound like my father at the beating of the Passover Seder. It's very nice. <laughs> Um, um, no, but I think what you said is <coughs> what my father doesn't say <coughs> at the Passover Seder is what you're saying in Milton is fine grace, meaning God gives you the liberty somehow to find grace. That grace is like this. I think it's a mediating term in some way that you have the grace to either you can, I don't know, is grace something that God gives you and God gives you the grace to choose, I guess. No, I don't think God gives you grace. I think you attain grace mm. by making the right choices. That by well, all right. By well, here's, here, 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 here's Milton on 180. Some I have chosen a peculiar grace, elect above the rest. So this is those people who are predestined, right? So is my will. The rest shall hear me call and oft be warned the sinful state and to appease betimes the incensed deity while offered grace invites. Is Jesus talking again? And I'll oft be warned their sinful state and to appease betimed the incensed deity, that's God, well offered grace invites. There is this, I mean, here, this is idea that grace is inviting you. 
I will clear their senses dark, what may suffice and soften stony hearts to pray, repent, and bring obedience to, to prayer, repentance, and obedience to. It's a weird combination of lines. Um, you know, uh, it's just, it's just before we end, I, I asked before, and this is really to kind of maybe bring together some of the things we're talking about. Why is it that Milton uses, um, why does he use this language of, of poetry when God talks to the sun, right? Meaning there's that, there's, that, there's that sense in which God, it doesn't make, it shouldn't make sense for God to talk to Jesus in this way, which assumes temporal uncertainty because Jesus is like God. But I told you in Paradise Lost, Jesus is not like God. And what happens later in book three, which is interesting, in book one, Satan asks for volunteers to go and take over that other world. And then everybody basically steps backwards and Satan is there. It's all affixed anyway. In this, God asks for volunteers to come in and, 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 and save man from death and Jesus volunteers. That even in Paradise Lost, even Jesus uses his free will. Um, and so why, so why does God speak to Jesus in metaphors? Because he's trying to convince him that there's still, a, there's a rhetorical situation that's still there. Maybe Satan will, maybe Satan will win. May, again, like it's a very weird story to tell because we already know how things turned out. But within the story, I think we do experience the uncertainty even of what the end of the story that we all know the end is going to be. And, and that perspective, that perspective of, um, of not knowing fully, even Jesus has that. Because, and, and why does he have that? because even his free choice has to be meaningful. And the only way it can be meaningful for Milton is if he's a created being. I Meaning not just an accident in Milton's theology that Jesus is a created being. It, 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 it allows him to articulate, to express a certain idea of free will. Um, I think that's yeah. the beauty, that one of the beauties of, of the poem that yeah. It's as if we don't know how it's going to end, that Milton constructs it in a way that it's like a suspense, no? What will happen? I think that's why that, that's it's so unique, right? What? right? No, that's very interesting. So like Stanley Fish, my old teacher, would say, well, there's Milton and he's hitting you over the head because you keep on, you keep on identifying with the wrong perspective. Mm -hmm. In a way, maybe what Chaya is saying is that, you know, Milton wants you to, when you leave the poem, you experience the world as process and unfinished, even though, of course, the whole story that we, that Milton's audience lives in is already finished. It's finished in line four and a half, line four of the poem, right? Till one greater man restore us, right? Nonetheless, there is that experience of uncertainty and process. And maybe that's part of the poem is accommodating that narrative in which we do feel uncertainty. Yeah, but it's amazing because at the pure beginning, he gives us the whole thing. And then... Right. So, so why doesn't he save our trouble and write a shorter poem and not write, write 12 books? Excuse me? Why, you know, why not write a shorter version of Paradise Lost? If he, if he expresses the whole thing in the first five lines, why bother going on? Yeah. Why bother it's, going it's on? Not, it's not a rhetorical question. I think part of the answer is, is that um, Milton acknowledges, first of all, that there is a necessity to, to, to write a theodicy, because if you don't write one, people are not prepared for life. Um, and also he feels, so he feels anxiety about that, but he does it. But he also think he also understands human psychology and how easy it is to not understand. That our default position is not understanding. Or our default position, this goes back to um, yet never saw, is that our default position is thinking that we understand when we don't. 
And the Milton maybe is like Stanley Fish a little bit showing us, oh, you, don't, you thought you knew, you don't know. You thought you were, you thought you were occupying a certain place. You thought you were, a, a, whatever, a good Christian, a good Protestant. No, you're not. I mean, and, and, that, and, that's, and, that, and that for Milton to be a good Protestant is to be a good reader. You are not reading. You are not reading. You thought you were, you're not. And maybe that, that perspective of living, I mean, on the other hand, as we've been saying all along, Milton never jumps to the end. Meaning we're, we're always, in, I mean, even though we read about the end, we're always in that presence of reading. We're always in the present of, re of reading. We'll, we'll never, if we think we get to the state of not reading, remember he who thinks he should picture his tent here, that person is very far from the truth. Or somebody who thinks they actually saw Satan, that person is very, very far from the truth. So it's, it's, um, it's the same thing. I think it's the same thing here. Does that make sense? Did I not finish my sentence? Just before we go. I, I don't know. I mean, is this satisfying? I mean, were, were, were um, no, just, I'm, I'm, I'm just looking. I'm wondering if anybody has any final words before we leave, because I know it's late, but I, I, I just want to make sure people have had the chance to, 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 to think out loud or ask any questions. Yeah, I've, I've read a philosophical theodicies. This is maybe my first poetic theodicy. There and because know. you've spoken at length about this, yeah. and what you create a kind of irony, but I'm with you about like, it, it's in his failure that it's a success, right? It's in his, some of his, I don't know, reasoned failures or however you would want to call it, where it's not me that philosophic thread or bar, but it's because it's all in a poetic uh, medium. And right, I don't right. really understand all of that. But, right, uh, right. So it, I mean, it is, a, and it is a process, right? There is this whole idea of process which gets emphasized. Um, but also, I guess the question that Tom is asking really is, how do I know poetry does anything? Meaning, how do I know that poetry, why should Milton have faith in poetry? Meaning, let's just hear the question. I'm not sure we can answer it right away, right? Milton gives you image after image after image. And I've been emphasizing the extent to which they all kind of qualify each other. And we understand that we can't understand anything from one perspective. But, but how do we know we can understand anything at all? How do we know that images help us at all? Is that just an assumption that Milton has as a poet? Meaning I have to give you an image to see something? And no, I think, I personally think yeah. that it is a lot to uh, the fact that he's blind here. I mean, when he was talking about the sight and he wants to show us things through his sight without seeing. He wants to show us how he sees things. Oh, I mean, that's what I think. Oh, that's interesting, right. right. That's why he's got his memories or and that's why he's trying to, that's what he's trying to show maybe. He sees things through not seeing. Yeah. Okay, just one more comment, Tikva, or anybody else? Tikva, go ahead, yeah. Hi, Tikva, so, yeah. The reason I raised my hand quickly is because I've been thinking about this a lot recently. Um, I think that one of the things that poetry does that philosophy books cannot do is that metaphors have layers. And so they can say multiple things at once and contradictory things at once, which is the way the world is. It contains contradictory things. It contains illogical things, things well, we, uh, uh, that philosophy well, I mean, can't express. Right. right. I mean, we also say that metaphor, by definition, it, it, it admits to its own insufficiency. Mm. Meaning it's always, I'm comparing something to something, but it's just that something. Meaning it's not, there's, there, meaning there is metaphors are built on similarity and difference. And the, in, in built into that difference is in a way that's humility. 
Now, physicists will say, well, <laughs> that's why we don't use metaphors, which they do anyway. Um, but because they, there's, a, there's a kind of thirst or a hunger in the world we live in for a world that's already interpreted, meaning a world that doesn't require metaphors, a world that's just immediately available to us. Um, but you're, also, but, and, and that's part of what I think Tikva is saying is that metaphors do have the ability I don't know. They, so they, uh, I guess the multiple. I, I just, I, I, um, I guess they have the ability to give us these partial representations. I'm just wondering why Milton's partial representations are privileged. Why should I believe? Why should I care what he says? Well, if I can answer the question from earlier, yeah. does does Milton help us or help me anyway? Think about these issues, you know, that we've been talking about for the past hour. I mean, not to be a Milton naysayer, because it's not my intention at all, but in a sense, not really, mm -hmm. right? Because, um, I mean, the way that I experience book three mm -hmm. feels way too much like my Catholic school education, which was just like, you know, I, like in the, in the religion textbook, a bunch of highlighted words and then, you okay. know, the in the margins, the definition of those right. words. Right, right. And, and I mean, it, the first three books are, are very, um, like, it, they're an amazing success in the sense that yeah. he's recreated the, um, the fall of man, right, in poetic aesthetic terms. Like, it, it, what reader is not seduced by books one and two? And then in three, you know, if, if, we, if we read... Um, God's comment when he says, I, I, just, I gave him everything. Right. I gave him everything to be able to stand Satan's uh, seductions and, and temptations. And he, did, he just couldn't do it. And so it's like, okay, <laughs> thank you. But I mean, so, but why, wh why must we conceive of our, um, of mm. our aesthetic response to books one and two in, in that way? So in a sense, Three doesn't help me think about these issues in any way, but one and two do. But then we're not allowed to have that response to one and two. Which is the, what are you not allowed to have a response? What response are you not allowed to have in one and two? In other words, by being seduced by books one and two. Oh, I see. Okay. You're, you're guilty of the fall of man. I see. Right? It's, I see. So that's enacted as a reader in that. And then in book three, you get all the doctrinal stuff. William Empson actually said, or somebody said that ever since William Empson went to, you know, his Protestant school, people have hated Milton's God. So kind of what your experience exactly, Ben, that he read Milton's God is stuff that he had heard in a classroom. Right. And you do kind of hear, you hear kind of Milton's God rapping on the table. Right. You know, I don't know. I mean, I kind of feel sorry for Milton there, Milton's God, because there really are no available arguments and he has to go in these twists and turns and, and maybe you could say of the paradox that he says that Milton is kind of well you know he wants you to basically say you can't you can't really answer this or I yeah. don't know the, the stuff at the end of book two about um sin and her son death who then yeah. rapes her I mean who can imagine better poetry Right. Well, Sam, Dr. Johnson hated that, but yeah. So that's the full, I told you, that's the false trinity, right? No. That, right. Um, and you see Milton, Milton has a sense of humor, right? Um, so Empson says about that, oh, you see that Milton is giving the, the devils the same status as the trinity, which is one way of reading it. Milton sa uh, Empson says that Milton and Marvell unleash the comparative anthropologists on the on the literary tradition on 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 the bible meaning now you see milton parrot you see the story of god is just another story in the library and there's another story next to it which is satan's story right that's how that's how emson is reading it kind of like you did um anybody else you know it's in in contrast to what yeah. Ben said, I've kind of been seeing um, the, just the whole book of Paradise Lost as, as a metaphor for being introduced to the religious world and the, the steps of understanding the religious world. 
or I mean, I think, the religious I think, world might be a. a I, I think it's, it's a, a little bit. Term. I don't know. If it's, I, I don't know if it's a little religious world for dummies. Um, no, what, no, that's not what I, what what I mean. I, I just before, the um, experience of they keep that at well, first you have this kind of fairy tale, you know, the the, the like draw of the occult and and uh, God seems really boring, and it's like, okay, why do I have to listen to this man blather on about free will, whatever, while I could be hanging out with Satan, and then. As the book progresses, so does our understanding oh. of of mm. Satan and of God and kind of that image mm. we had, that kind of fairy tale flat image we had in the first three book first three books kind of falls apart. So we have to see if that's in fact true. We'll see the representation of the fall of Adam and Eve, right? How the how that fits in. Yeah, well, we haven't gotten there yet. Have we met Adam and Eve yet? No. We will meet Adam and Eve very, very soon. Just like we don't meet Odysseus until book, what, five of the Odyssey? Four, I think. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, one of those. Um, so we don't meet Adam and Eve, I think, to book, oh, book four of Paradise Lost. So guys, you can go now. If anybody wants to hang out, I said I would hang out for a little while longer for people who want to. Um, next class, we'll probably do book, I think, we don't make very much progress, right? I mean, my, I'm choosing, as you, as I'm choosing just to focus on this issue that I told you from the very beginning that I'm very interested in is the whole issue of, of, of poetry and representation and reading. And all of, our, all of our readings have kind of been focusing around that. And I don't think, I think they all emerge from, from, from the poem. But I think for me, really doing these very close readings, which are, I think, things my colleagues would not have the patience for. They wouldn't, they wouldn't go with me. So I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that you are going with me. And I know it's so, so what I'm saying is if people have questions at the beginning of next class, if you want, if, um, um, if people need um, clarification about anything, please let me know. Okay? Or if, there other, or if there are other parts of the poem that you think we should, you know, I am very interested. If there are parts of, the, of book four that really appeal to you, um, please tell me before class and we'll focus on those. Really, I'm really asking you now because I really do consider you to be Miltonist and I don't consider a lot of people to be Miltonist. A Miltonist is somebody who hears Milton's voice. What you end up doing with that is very hard because it's so, it, it's so kind of difficult to nail down and because it's, it's in, it, it speaks in different voices. Um, but to be sensitive to that is to just, to, oh, that, and then when, once you hear that, you're like, oh, that's why people argue about this poem for 300 years, right? Because it's, because it's complicated in ways which are, like Shakespeare is complicated in ways that are infinite. Milton is complicated in ways that seem to be finite, right? That you can kind of like figure out like what are, what are the available perspectives or positions? What might he be saying here? Meaning because it is, because it is in some sense, a binary world. So book four next time, and if you have any favorite, you know, favorite songs, only book four? I think so. Okay. I mean, book five and six, maybe I'll change, maybe this part of book five. Book five and six are really strange. We, the, the, the central event of the poem, and the whole poem temporally is kind of screwed up, right? Because the central event of the poem, or the two central events, one is the fall of man, and one is the fall of Satan. And the first one is the fall of Satan, and that doesn't happen until book five and six. So that kind of, books five and six are kind of that war in heaven. We kind of look at, we'll look at that as one, one unit, I think. So let's go for book four. And, um, you know, we always can end early. We haven't managed really to do that yet. Seven o'clock already. Guys, okay. So go home, eat, well, go into another room, turn your desk around, go to your Facebook page if you haven't already been there. Okay, see you. I'm not going to end the meeting, okay. but you can leave, not Thank leave, you. whatever you want. Thank, okay. you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Um, I wanted to Thank you. ask about the, the astronomer thing. Yes. Um, so, so you, you're you're going to like, I'm, I have like very good headphones. My, my ears are going to fall off. You I'm sorry. Like... <laughs> I, I, give me one moment. Okay, yeah. Oh, so. I, I don't know why it's like that. Um, in, give me one moment. I'll find the bit I was talking about. Um, when we were talking about the whole... Can I ask a really quick question, Tikva? Yes, please. Yeah, go for it. In that the meantime, um, is, it, is it possible um, to give us specific parts that we should focus on as opposed to just saying book four? Um, is that, like is, you is, say, is in book four, is, I guess, you know, the truth is, is that when I read the last part of book three, I was very overwhelmed by it and I had to read it twice. 
and I've read it many times. So I, I, I appreciate that it's, it's not, on the other hand, once you hear his voice, if you do, if you, if you, if you do concentrate, you can, you can read it. Um, but I will tell you, I, I will say the passages that we will really focus on. But just for the experience, you're going to be getting a bunch try to read the whole book. Right? Try to read all the book. I mean, I know it's, I know it's, I know it's, um, I mean, if you really want to have fun, read it out loud. Tikva, why don't you read it to your sister? Tell your sister that your instructor said- We can act it out. She would not last very long. It'll be a play. Um, well, if you want- I'll sure. play Satan. You want to play Satan? Yeah. Not the best line. Tikva, Tikva will play God and I will be Satan. Oh, you think so? Okay. And, and uh, not sure C, I would make think, a good C, do you think you would be up to play Adam or no? No, I'm not. You're not I, I can't. I don't look the part. You don't, you're not ideal. I, Adam is a, he's a very big guy. He's an idealist. So you're not idealistic. You're too cynical. Yeah. Professor, but do you think, do you think it's really, it's really, it would be better to, to shorten the, because I think three hours isn't, isn't even, isn't enough to cover. No, so I, I'm going, I'm, I'm, I'm committing the sin of caring about um, your well being and not coverage, right? So. You look very good upside down, see? That, that was no, it's just, I'm holding my phone because. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was very interesting. Um, so yeah, I know, so that's why I said, it, it, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot. I'm happy to do a little bit more if you want to, whatever. It's not, it's not like our discussions, like people are gonna miss something that's gonna be on the final. It's like, we're just approaching the whole poem. We really, we're reading the poem. Yeah, I mean, I don't wanna, I don't wanna feel like we are punching, punching the clock, you know what I'm saying? It's just, Okay. It's um, it's just hard when people have like class from eight a.m. until eight. I, I, like now I totally bad. hear that. I told that's why I ended class early. Um, are there any other more? Are there any other questions? I found the bit I wanted to talk about earlier. It's not it's not okay. actually the astronomer. I was wrong. Okay. Um, I, about the beginning, we talked about the different metaphors he uses, yeah. and like the first fifty lines, he talks about you know the fields and the muses, and then he moves on to like some totally other different metaphor. Right. I'm sorry, I'm speaking loudly again. Um, so like he starts with talking about the Stygian pool and then, Well, he leaves, you know, right. Well, well, right. Well, again, right. Um, he says, he emphasizes his blindness and not seeing. And right. then the next thing he does is makes the reader see. Right. right, and he talks about how he's not sure how he can sing. And um, to me, what, what it looks like is he's kind of, in those first 50 lines, he's writing in the style of multiple different biblical poems. And he's kind of saying, well, can I really do this? Can I write in God's voice? And then he writes like he's in Shir HaShirim, and he writes like he's in Eicha, and he writes like, uh, yeah, Sarah, and, then, to, and love, then he's like, I, okay, I yes, I can to, do this. Okay, I would love to see, if you want to do that, show, just make, make a, uh, go through it and put little footnotes about where you think Milton is referring to people. Um, I mean, that's just an interesting project. You could, you could definitely do something like that to see the way in which Milton is, is using the biblical stories. Were there any other passages here that we thought we should read? Or does any other, anybody have any other question? And I just wanted to comment that yeah. not as a theodicy, only as a literary work yeah. Uh, yeah. with all the ambiguity and everything that he brings us, especially in this part that we just studied, I can see why it is like the, the basis, the fundament of, of all the rest of literature, because it's, why? Well, I think it's so, so powerful. I think it's amazing. I'm really enjoying which part, it. Which part? Which part? Which part? Milton's God? You find amazing? No. Um, uh, that's got what we learned today about uh, of, um, no, uh, 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 the perspective that it comes and it goes, and that about the lens, which you said about the lens that we see it, but we really don't see it. All these right. things. I. I I, I really like it very much. Well. I'm enjoying it very much. I know well, it's, it must be very hard for you to teach in this way. And well, by, I, think I think it's harder for you to learn. I mean, the Romantic Sublime but, and the Romantics were very, very influenced by Milton. The Romantic Sublime is a kind of, it's like a going an even step further. Like you go to Wordsworth goes to wherever he goes and he's overwhelmed by an experience of nature. Nature takes him beyond nature. That's really some of us, we talked a little bit about the Kantian Sublime. Right, Immanuel Kant, the philosopher, this idea that the sublime is the thing that transcends our experience. It transcends language. And in a way, Milton's poem is sublime insofar that it seems to be pointing 
to something that I can't know or that I can only know through the act of pointing. That's kind of why I asked before, why do I care? M Milton's, met I mean, there are lots of metaphors to talk about the divine. Why should I take Milton at his word? I mean, why does he, have, I think that's the question that he's maybe trying to answer himself. How do I have authority to do this? And I think he, I think part of his authority is maybe his, comp his compulsion, his conviction to do it. I don't know. I mean, you hear my, you hear what I'm just saying is, wh why should I believe these images? Meaning, okay, fine, there's this, there is this sublime thing that you're positing, but how do I know I get any closer to it through your palm? And that's why I was saying that I'm only talking about in the literal sense and not as, as the audience. Oh, there's, there's, <laughs> hi, there's, there's, it's all one thing. It's all the I one know, thing. I know, I know. I can only see it, I know, but I only see it as a, well, in a literary sense, because I'm yeah, not I've involved been, see, in I've, I've been I've been reading the poem for a very, very long time. I can imagine. <laughs> uh, no, but I, I, think I'm, I think I'm understanding the poem in ways I never did before. Mm -hmm. With your help. Well, I really, I'm really enjoying it a lot. I know it must be, you as see, I told you, 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 I, I, you mentioned Chai. <laughs> yeah, no, it must Donna, be hard. You, Donna, do you have a question? Donna, yeah, do you have a question? I want to say, yeah, I wanted to say that I think that the end of the book is, Extremely important because um, Uriel, how would you say Uriel in English? Or, uh, I don't, I, it's, I, Uriel. Uh, right. So you live on, <laughs> don't you live on Uriel? Uh, there's a street right in my neighborhood. Ah, so, no, no, I live a little oh, it's bit. Uziel, it's Uziel, Uziel, right? Sorry. Uziel, no, Uziel, Uriel, Uriel, Uriel. 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 <laughs> right. Oriel means, of course, light, right? But close, right. close to it, but not quite. So I think it's just a fight. Um, why Saturn is so compelling and should be so compelling. Oh, good, right. And if you don't see evil and if you don't perceive it, um, you cannot cope with it. So if you, are, if you want, don't want to end up like Oriel and to be a dumb reader, we need to Very acknowledge good, right. the, yeah. Very good, right. So Oriel, is, he's not really a dumb reader. He's just not qualified because he lives among angels. So you don't have he's to- naive. So well, yeah, you, well, you don't need a BS detector if you're in heaven, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, meaning it's not that he's naive. He's just it's not his it's not his paradigm. But I think yeah. you're right. We, we, and, and, but it just follows what you're saying. Still, we're not angels. We we are not Uriel. And I think you're right also that the end of it um, emphasizes the narrative aspect. Meaning here's Satan tricking Uriel. He's getting him to tell him something, right? Here's yeah. Satan, the, the crafty, he's like Odysseus, right? The crafty yeah. spy getting his way, which again emphasizes that narrative. So, mm -hmm. right? So there, there's Satan, there's God's time, God's narrative. There's Satan's narrative. And then there's the narrative of Adam and Eve. And distinguishing between God, uh, Satan's and Adam and Eve's, that's, that's an interesting one. I guess, I guess Adam and Eve, they, their narratives are developing and Satan's isn't. Meaning, I think the more we learn about Satan, the more we learn that he's just, um, he's fixated on himself. And insofar that he's fix, fixated on himself and his own glory, Jesus always talks about bringing glory to God. It's always a little bit ambivalent, ambiguous. First, Jesus brings glory, end of line, to God. But the ultimate, the ultimate uh, location of glory is to God. While Satan always brings glory just to himself. Jesus is a mediator. Satan is just the thing itself, right? That's, he just says, I am. It's just, there's not, there's not, and that's why I said fixation. He's fixated on himself, the narcissist. Mm -hmm. right. um, you were talking about like- an individual, an, an individual and not a narcissist. Well, More like, human. Uh, sorry, yes, yeah, so I'm, re I'm reading it. Right, so that's the weird part is he is the more human yeah, but I'll should, we'll should look at parts in the poem where you really see that Milton's narrator is giving it to him, meaning, meaning, I looked at your sense of more human that we and more relatable, and maybe more relatable because we're some humans have the tendency to be narcissistic, but Milton is ungenerous, right? That's what I always wonder about people who say, "Well, Satan is the hero of Paradise Lost." Milton's extremely ungenerous in very explicit ways to say, "We'll see." And, and just calling him a narcissist and being and just being too into himself. And Jesus is happy to be a privileged mediator. Language is, is mediation for Milton. 
And Jesus is the privileged mediator. You want to know the God, you, and that's the beginning of book three, which we didn't get to. How do you know the Father? Only through the Son, which may be a way of qualifying everything that we read up until now. Well, how, you know, I'm, I'm just read a, I just read a, a poem, and I'm not, re the only way I can really know God is through the image of the Son. It's complicated. Yes, Alana. You're, you're not on. You're, you're talking to yourself. Yeah. Okay. Now talk. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Okay. I'm a little disturbed about the beginning because when he says, "May I express um, the unblamed," and then he, you know, his his modesty in a way because he's not writing this spontaneously, obviously, and oh. and he's going to answer it by, "Yes, I can do it," and so it seems a little bit immodest to have. Oh, I, I said, I mean, he says even what in Il Penseroso, uh, um, something like prophetic something. I mean, he thinks of himself as a prophet, as a, something like a prophet at 29. So he said there is this ultimate, there's this, I think there's a humility before the task, but also the chutzpah that, yeah, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. <laughs> and it's just sort of like this humility just sort of like emphasizes how uh, great, courageous, or whatever he is, because he's okay. saying what it's, I, it's not. It, yeah. It's not. It's not hard to look at Milton himself as a narcissist. Yeah. But <laughs> but but I think he. Uh, I you know I think he merits it. I mean you know I mean. I mean he's got he's got he's got a good reason to be. No, he. Fe I think. Forget what I'm saying. He's just. He feels this mission that I think he that, that he must write this poem, mm -hmm. which is why I don't don't and I'm you know I don't understand the satanic. I mean I understand Blake. Blake is saying Milton's of the Devil's Party without knowing it, right? So he didn't really know. But people say that Milton's of the Devil's Party didn't know it. How could you say that? I mean, what what makes him write a poem to justify the ways of God to man? Where is where is the urgency of intention? The urgency of mission? I think when you write a book, don't you have to feel like there's an urgency to it? Donna, you would say, what do you think about that? How, what's the urgency that you feel when you want to write a book, when you write one of the novels you've written? Um, I think I want to express myself and notions I have and to hmm. give a glimpse of my, my own perspective about things in the world um, through a book, through something that, through a tale, something that you can hmm. aspire to, I don't know, to understand and to, um, find within your own individual truths. And how, how does that relate to the audience that you imagine? Wow, that's a hard question. <laughs> I need to think about it. I mean, I think it's because you want to express this. You, you, th you must be implicit in that, that you feel that your perspective is valuable and you want to share it. Yeah, I think I feel, I feel I can see stuff or things um, in a certain way and that I need to express them through writing. We're losing Donna again, but, but or sort of. yeah, we, we lost you, but, but I think this idea that, you know, you have a, a, a writer, I mean, let's think about it, right? An author, a writer, where I'm sure many of us here are writers. Um, you know, you have, I guess you, you have a, the, the feeling is not just that, oh, I have a voice, but maybe I have a voice in relationship to other people, or maybe I have a voice, and Donna's saying not only a voice, but a vision. I mean, I think what you're saying is I can see things that yeah. maybe, I'm, I'm, in a way, you're just doing what we've been talking about with Milton. You're provided, providers, readers, providing readers with a lens to see something they never saw before, I, I assume, right? Or to see it in a different way. John is frozen or disagreeing with me? <laughs> yeah, I heard you partially, but yeah, I yeah. think so. <laughs> um, I think it's sort of languish. I don't know what you said. What's languish? Like, make, yeah. make accessible. Okay, well, that, that Maybe listen. To make it more approachable, but not. Well, that, so that's the, the, what Milton is well, doing. I what, what, what Milton is doing, well, I just got a, a, a text from the gym saying the gym is open. Um, that's, 
amazing, right? Wow. <laughs> um, I, I, mean, I assume that's what it says. Um, Milton, um, that's what Milton is doing, is uh, the, he's a way to talk about what you just described is accommodation, right? It's your, I, I need yeah, to okay, find a way, I need, no, but that it's like, it's like, how do I accommodate the divine to the human, right? right. And in a way, you're doing the same thing. You have certain ideas, whatever. I don't want to, you know, ideas, ideals, and you need to find a way of accommodating them so people can hear them. So that's part of what Milton is doing. He's, he is, as a poet, he's trying to accommodate this vision that he has to others. And, and, he, has, and he has a problem because he's a Puritan and he's an iconoclast and he wonders how he can find a mechanism to do that which won't betray his ideals. Mm -hmm. All right, gang, I'm gonna go eat dinner. See, I hope you're not disappointed with the last, not getting the last 10 minutes, but I can only see your ceiling. <laughs> All right, bye guys. Thank see you, Professor. Bye, thank you so much. Take care, see you soon. <laughs>